Spookies, and welcome to Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours, Ghoulie, Ricky J. Duarte. Today, we're taking a trip into gateway horror, which is one of my favorite things to talk about within the genre, kind of those movies that got us started in horror growing up. And my guest today is a super exciting and talented individual. A year ago at this time, released an incredible album of classical music inspired and geared toward the holiday of Halloween. It's beautiful and haunting, and I can't wait to hear all about it from him. He is a Los Angeles-based composer and has worked in music for the likes of Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, and a collection of feature films. Please welcome to the show, George Stryker. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you. Welcome to Rick or Treat HorrorCast. Thank you. Your music is haunting and (laughs) beautiful and reminiscent of everything that I love about the fall and about Halloween. Listening to your music, I just want to be wrapped up in like a flannel blanket with like a chai latte and a jack-o'-lantern and a spooky movie on TV. And holy cow, thank you for what you've done. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and talk about music of the macabre? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for saying that. I uh, that's essentially how I wrote <laughs> the album. I uh, uh, it's obviously a very nostalgic, um, which I think most people listening to it would gather. I wrote it when I was back home in Illinois over the uh, pandemic. Actually, being home for the first, I, I live in Los Angeles now. I've been here about about fifteen years, and I'd never hadn't been back for the fall for for a long time. So when I was there. I kind of, you know, yeah, found myself wrapped in blankets watching spooky movies and it sort of brought me back to that vibe of Halloween that I remember growing up in the 90s so much with. So with the album, I really wanted to kind of try and capture that feeling of that era growing up and obviously paid homage to a lot of the sounds of movies like Casper and movies like uh, Hocus Pocus and things like that. And also the classical repertoire that we sort of um, have assigned to Halloween, things like Night uh, and Bald Mountain and Dance Macabre and, and things like that. So that was really the initial spark that got me into it. And then uh, specifically per track from there, um, a lot of different inspirations, uh, including that little shaking ghost decoration that we all remember growing up with in that you know, theremin woo yep. sound that oh, I yeah. took to uh, direct inspiration for a piece that's on the album. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, it was just a work of of love and nostalgia. And uh, I also thought there's not a lot of um, live orchestral original Halloween music albums out there. They're all either synthesizers, ambient music, or they're rehashes of uh classical music that we've decided is halloween music now or their film scores so i decided to write a completely original live orchestral album for halloween specifically it's so moody when i was a kid i have a specific halloween memory of going trick-or-treating and believing that it was real believing Mm. that all of these kind of costumes around me were actually real and that the night was mad it's just you know i think it's what i cling to for the rest of my life to (laughs) to try to find that magic again in something you know yeah i think it has that power halloween for sure for kids you also utilize influences including referencing famous spooky music in at least one or one of your tracks using takata and fugue as well correct yeah i do yeah in memories of halloween um which is the most nostalgic piece on the album, uh, including that those two notes from that, that shaking ghost decoration that I opened with and used it to develop the melody.
I referenced Takata and Fugue very lightly in there, um, mostly because that's all you ever heard <laughs> right. on Halloween was every Halloween decoration, it's public domain, every Halloween decoration would have na 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 as like the default sound in the factory that they'd apply. So. It's also a homage to a CD I grew up listening to from the 90s called Classics from the Crypt, which was an Arthur Fiedler with the Boston Pops uh, performing all those said classical pieces that uh, we've assigned Halloween attributions to. Um, so I just tried to cram as much as I could into that piece, and, and that was one of them. I, I feel like a lot of families had that Halloween album. We had on vinyl like an old, old record just mm. of spooky sounds, and I remember listening to it sitting on my grandma's lap one halloween and i got so afraid i peed on her lap oh my god <laughs> she oh was no mad she was so <laughs> mad about it but you know those impressions that that really really last do you have a favorite track on the album on my album yeah. i'd have to say it's memories of halloween yeah. that, that one really uh when i when i realized it when i was like well what's that I, I was going through old decorations at our house at my mom's house rather in illinois when i was stuck there over COVID. Uh, and it was fall and I was just kind of, as I think we all did, sort of <laughs> dove into nostalgia at a time it was just like there was nothing else to do. Um, and I found that thing and I thought, oh my god, those are notes. And that those are intervals, and that that could be a melody. You could that's the beginning of a melody. Um, and I just remember, yeah, going on a walk through my hometown in the autumn with all the leaves on the ground and, and the, you know the chill in the air and everything. And that really that was the most inspired track for sure. Everything else obviously had inspiration, but there was maybe a little more craftsmanship in that stuff. This one was purely inspiration for me. So for me, that's the most that's my favorite track on the album. It's an excellent track. It, I mean, they really all are. And kind of um, evokes a response of maybe thinking like one of them is maybe a little Adams Family-esque, one of them yeah. is a little Hocus Pocus-esque, but they are mm -hmm. all you. And that is very clear from start to finish on this album, that it's it, it all is one continuous piece and one continuous work. Um, I'm a you. big fan of Samhain. I think that that's a really, really, uh, yes. really great track for sure. And The Ghost of John, tell me a little bit about using that particular melody. Yeah, Ghost of John, which I think I'll, I've, I've been so happy to see how many people also grew up with that creepy, creepy tune. Yeah. <laughs> we used to sing that in, uh, I believe, elementary school music. Yep. We had a little choir in elementary school. And it was really creepy. And I guess uh, they're not really sure where it came from. They sort of think it's either Apple, 1800s Appalachians in the United States, or it could go all the way back to England, you know, in the 1700s or something, or the American Revolution. Yeah, that I ha I just that was another purely nostalgic thing, and I, I looked it up, you know, did some research, and like, oh, so it is public domain. A lot of people have covered it, and it is actually, in fact, a folk song. So I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool to do a sort of. Uh, uh, obviously, my version has a little more energy to it. I, I started off with the normal sort of slow, spooky pace, and then took it into a, I think it was a twelve-eight time, something a little more kind of. Um, a lot of people have said it kind of sounds like a sea shanty in my presentation, which is huh. totally, totally appropriate given the era I was trying to evoke. Um, but yeah, I just, I wanted to, you know, uh, just do an instrumental version of that. Um, and because that had such a, that there's that piece really 
immediately takes you somewhere <laughs> like, that immediately sets a tone so i thought i just have to include that on the on the album um and uh Sawin is interesting too because i i actually was i my inspiration for it was i want to write a somewhere in my memory for halloween <laughs> <laughs> wow like, so i was like what's like a it has to be choral so it has to have lyrics um and i'm not much of a lyricist but i i, I try every now and then so i really tried on this one to write kind of a spooky somewhere in my memory but about Sawin, obviously the you know origins of halloween Uh, and it actually just started as a solo choral piece. I wasn't going to, you know, put it to, with an orchestra, but then I just played around with it. You know, after I recorded the choir, I wrote an orchestral arrangement around and it sort of drew from Harry Potter a lot and from from uh, Hocus Pocus a little bit in its orchestration and arrangement. Uh, and it just blew up from there. And then I have the choral a cappella version at the end of the album as well, just because I thought it was so beautiful the way they performed it. It is. It's a really, it's a talented, talented a uh, group of musicians playing the yeah. score. I mean, you had you had a full orchestra for this. Yeah, the Budapest Scoring Orchestra and Choir um, is an awesome uh, company. Out of, obviously, out of Budapest, uh, they do a ton of film, TV, video games, um, albums. I, they worked with Danny Elfman on his recent albums and stuff. Oh, I think they did Wednesday, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, they work with everybody, but it's so accessible. And you can get in on, you know, these smaller sessions or you can sort of build your own ensemble. And it was so easy to sort of uh, coordinate with them and, and work with the on their calendar and stuff and booking strings only, brass only. And usually I did full ensemble on its own uh, altogether, I mean. But yeah, it was such a thrill to work with them. And they, since they do so much television and film work, they're really, really good. And a lot, some of these pieces on the album were complicated and not not in the sense that they're you know uh extraordinary it's just that they they take time to figure out and get down because they're reading these this music cold they're not rehearsing this they get the music right in front of them minute one and they have to play it and obviously we have incredible musicians in la who do that as well and they're, they're probably the best in the world but the budapest guys are, are pretty darn pretty darn good That's so fascinating. Your social media is incredible about documenting the process and, you know, you also talking about your inspiration and, and you know, it's, it's kind of like hashtag goals for social media <laughs> when it comes to branding, I've got to say. Congratulations on that. You're crushing well, it. Thank you so much. I, my my day job is actually working in advertising. So I, I as, a, as a creative, not as a producer. So I, I work as an editor. Um, and I obviously do music on, on the side as well. But uh, I think that has helped me a lot in yeah. being able to just produce stuff. It's also extremely fun. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, this is not a second of labor for me. I get, I'm so excited to have found a community of people out here, or to have found the Halloween community rather, uh, which has existed for a long time. Um, but to be part of that and to just make stuff that I think people will like and that I like and that everybody just enjoys it and, um, you know, I certainly didn't get into this this uh, this album with the goal of making money or anything like that. It was really a hundred percent just to do this, just to make stuff and and share it with people. And it's been so cool to see how many people immediately resonated with it. Absolutely. <laughs> like immediately, they all knew exactly what I was talking about, and it's really cool. And it's it's enough to make me just like do another one. You know. I, for two things, first off, <laughs> uh, you know, not to be too on the nose, but you struck a chord with a particular group of people, I think, mm -hmm. uh, with, with this, with this album, the sound of it, the feel of it. And also was going to ask, can we expect a music of the Mac Macabre volume two? 
I'm definitely working on like making a list of ideas of things I'd want to try different kinds of music that I didn't have on the first album. There's been a lot of different stuff thrown at me. People have said, um, some of the musicians I've worked with have said, you know, you should do a folksy kind of like, I like the ghost of John smaller ensemble kind of folksy Appalachian spooky version of an album, which should certainly be a lot smaller than a full orchestra, <laughs> uh, which is expensive. Um, and then, uh, but then I, I can't get away from wanting to do truly scary music too with an orchestra, <laughs> like okay. really get, getting into the Penderecki, as you know, the Shining, Penderecki and Bartok's music is all throughout that. Very challenging to write that kind of music, very challenging to, per challenging to perform that kind of music. Mm. It would be a lot of fun to do that. And this Halloween or this October, I do have a new piece for uh, violin and piano that I'm planning to, to post too. Oh, performance of so cool that's exciting yeah where can my listeners listen to your music and where can they purchase it you have it in really cool physical forms of physical media i do yeah uh, music of the macabre is of course available on spotify uh, as well as several other albums that i've done uh, most of which are related to films that i've worked on but i do have a few personal things up there as well um I also have uh, the website for Music of the, of the Macabre, which is just musicmacabre.com. And I'm currently selling CDs. Uh, cassettes are getting low in uh, inventory. And I believe, unfortunately, the vinyls have sold out. <laughs> so I think I might need to be, might need to press some more vinyl. Um, but, and then there's obviously digital uh, wave copies of that available on the website as well. Terrific. Well, it, listeners, I cannot recommend this enough. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful, spooky, nostalgic, as you said, music. And if you like what you've heard already, then you should absolutely seek this out and listen to more because this is a wonderfully talented human being. And I can't wait to talk about the movie that we've decided on today. But before we get to it, I like to take a moment and recommend horror that we have recently consumed. So movies that you've watched, TV, books that you've read, music you've listened to, video games. Do you have any recommendations? Oh yeah, I uh, I just saw the uh, the movie Talk to Me. I thought was really really good. Sure. And this is this is obviously this is not a recent movie, but it's a movie I've been pushing on everybody because <laughs> I saw it not too long ago. It's called Lake Mungo. Oh yeah. And uh, it's an Australian horror film. Yeah, it's like a, a sort of a mock documentary thing, but it is probably one of the most chilling movies I've ever seen. Uh, so I highly recommend Lake Mungo. I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. Oh yeah, very. It really gets under your skin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talk to me. Also, is is a hit, and it just surpassed yeah. Hereditary as the highest grossing A twenty four movie. Yeah, I thought A24, it was terrific. Man. Yeah, all every time, every time. I am yeah. now on the A twenty four advanced screening list, and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I wow. feel like that now. I've made it as a podcast. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> uh, that that film was. You know, here is my thing. I really enjoyed it. I recommend it. There is nothing wrong with it. I, I, it, it. I didn't fully connect with it. I think the way that I was supposed to. Yeah. When it ended, I I thought that there was still twenty minutes left to the movie. I didn't realize that that climb. I thought the climax was the rising action. Mm hmm. Um, but the ending is appropriate and I think it's a terrific film. I love it. Well, you know what? I won't give anything away. We don't spoil anything at this point, oh, yeah. but good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did. Yeah, very much. So there is this man on Instagram named Mike Pesci. He is a film director. And if you DM him your top three favorite horror movies, if he agrees with them, he will send you a link to watch his movie on Vimeo. It's about 40 minutes long. It's called 12 kilometers and it is really cool first off i think that the marketing campaign is kind of interesting it's a little bit of word of mouth it's a little bit of interactive right here's the thing i don't know how many people he's turning away if they list three movies but it's it kind of makes you think like a little bit like god what are i have trouble listing my favorite horror movies yeah. i hate that question you know i think it's really complicated for me personally but the movie is absolutely worth watching i think it's very beautifully shot very well acted a very unique concept and kind of takes you somewhere in a short amount of time. So highly recommend Mike Pesci, film director, look him up on Instagram and uh, tell him your three favorite movies. And if you are as cool as me, he's going to let you watch his. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say all, all the bad Nightmare on Elm Street movies. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a couple of them. All right, well, all right, those are our recommendations. What do you say we go trick-or-treating? Oh, I'm very excited, let's do it. All right. Hey, Spookies. 
Like many of you, I'm a big collector of horror VHS tapes. Some of my favorite titles include Night of the Giving Head, Buffy the Vampire Lair, Grabbing in the Woods, A Wet Dream on Elm Street, The Last Whore House on the Left, Evil Head, The XX Exorcist, and The Midnight Meat Train. However, after playing them over and over and over and over, I found that the quality was becoming less than satisfactory, and I began having trouble fitting those tapes into my slot. My VCR slot, that is. Well, not to worry. All new Anonymous Head Video Head Cleaning Solvent from Pigpen does the trick. Pigpen's Anonymous Head Video Head Cleaning Solvent is guaranteed to get rid of all your video head problems with its strong formula and potent reliability. This solvent comes in an attractive, sleek, sexy, and spooky skull-shaped bottle. Oh, and it smells great too. Pigpen's Anonymous Head Video Head Cleaning Solvent cleared my VHSs right up, and now I never have a problem getting a tape into my slot. And right now, you can get 20% off Pigpen's Anonymous Head Video Head Cleaning Solvent and more Pigpen products, including t-shirts and apparel, by visiting their website and using code RICKORTREAT at checkout. The brand is Pigpen, and the code is RICKORTREAT for 20% off. What are you waiting for? Try Anonymous Head from Pigpen today. Go ahead, get some head. Today, we are talking about 1995's Casper, directed by Brad Silberling in his feature film debut, uh, got the job about a week before filming started. The movie is written by uh, Sherry Stoner and Joseph Oriolo with an uncredited pass by J.J. Abrams, if you can believe that. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, The movie has, uh, in my opinion, a very out there cast but i really love all of them bill pullman who is always a delight as dr harvey we have christina ricci as his daughter cat national treasure kathy moriarty (laughs) she's fabulous as kerrigan the villain we have eric (laughs) idol as dibs Mm -hmm. in um, i he has said that he doesn't remember filming this movie he won't talk about it he is very embarrassed about this movie oh that's a shame i thought he was wonderful i know The voice of Casper is Malachi Pearson. I believe this may be his only role. And then we have a series of cameos that we'll get get to as we (laughs) go throughout the film. Uh, I will say as the voices of the ghostly trio, we have Joe Napoti as Stretch, Joe Alasky as Stinky, and Brad Garrett from Everybody Loves Raymond as Fatso in his first voiceover role. So as I mentioned in the intro to this video, Casper is... One of the prime examples of gateway horror for young people. Mm-hmm. George, when was the first time you saw Casper? I think I saw Casper in the theater. Yeah. Um, when it came out. I've, actually, one of my memories of Casper was seeing it, I think, at our local. We had a little local theater. Obviously, we had like an AMC and stuff. We had a little local theater from the 20s that would, in that day, show new movies. Now they just show uh, movies that have been out for like a year. Um but I think we went and saw Casper there, and I'm pretty sure the projector burned out. <laughs> in oh the no! Of that. Yeah, like the bulb went, and I remember having to go and see it again. Um, but that's my real, real memory of it, specifically because the theater being very old from the 20s, and I, I think the architecture in this movie—it's Gaudi, I think is the name. Is the the yes. name? Yeah, mm-hmm. I think the theater kind of looked like that. It was a very old theater. So I think that sort of imprinted this memory on me of like feeling like I was in the movie almost. But yeah, I remember liking it very much. Uh, Speaking of gateway horror, which I guess we'll get to that later. um, A couple of the cameos that show up in the movie were definitely, uh, Casper definitely was a gateway to who was that? And it led me into this. (laughs) this That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. There are some very specifically mid nineties references. Oh yes. <laughs> in Mo, this yes. movie. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's deliciously nineties. This yeah. whole movie. Oh, for sure. I, I too saw it in movie theaters and I was just enamored with this movie to this day. It is like, it's a big comfort movie for me. It's right up there yeah. with uh, something like practical magic or, you know, these movies that I fall asleep to or can watch over and over and over again and never get tired of. It's just kind of like comfort food for me. And that's how I feel about 
this movie. We had it on VHS in the clam box, which I know you, is, yeah. is this the same copy that you had? Oh, I wish, but it's, it's, uh, we did have the clam shell, but this is not the one from my childhood. I actually bought this on eBay, brand new and sealed. Wow. And uh, I opened it for the first time and it still has inside of it. It's going to be noisy. Still has inside of it all the rebates for Pepsi and all that stuff. What? From 1995, yeah. Oh, that's so. Also, don't um, don't ever apologize for opening a, can- a clamshell box on my podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's this creaky shell. Oh, but man, yeah, I love neat. it. And it's funny because as you mentioned it, it being a comfort movie, it kind of is for me too. I think uh, this and Jumanji, the Robin Williams Jumanji. Yes. I remember seeing so distinctly in the theater. I guess they're around the same time. I think maybe Jumanji was 96 um, or maybe the same year. Uh, But yeah, I I remember seeing them so distinctly that uh, I could could put them on and it's sort of immediately sort of transportive. And there's something just so nice about them too. (laughs) You know, and they're really well made movies. And um, yeah, it's just, it's such a, it's pretty wild what a different era it was when you look at these things, how movies have changed. It's true. They don't, um, I hate to sound like this, but they don't make movies like this anymore, but they (laughs) They genuinely don't. don't. And we will get into the more mature themes of this movie. And you know what I like about this movie? It treats children like they are intelligent, Mm -hmm. right? It deals with themes of death and grief Mm -hmm. and sorrow and loss in a, in a way that children can understand, but it's not like, it's not like trolls too, or, yeah. you know, what was that Kraken movie that just came out where the trailer gave me a headache. The, there are um, a yeah. series of movies coming out for kids these days that, um, I don't know. They're just not, just not what they were when we were growing up. They weren't. Yeah. And there's also a thing about, and I don't know if this is a modern thing. I mean, they definitely had, this definitely existed back then too, but where kids are smarter than their parents. Mm. Um, which I feel is kind of like, eh, it's like, no, nah, not really. But in, in these movies, it felt like they were peers mm-hmm. in a way Brilliant. where Kat and her dad are going through. They're both obviously dealing with loss. He doesn't really look down on her. She doesn't look down on him. They're both, they both flawed. Her dad's kind of bumbling. He's like the bumbling nutty professor kind of thing. But, uh, and the same in, in Jumanji where it feels like Peter, I think was his name and, and uh, the Bonnie Hunt character where it does feel like they're all, all kind of equals and they're all sort of dealing with this sudden be, being thrust suddenly into maturity, uh, which is uh, a pretty big theme to deal with in a kid's movie. It is. That's really true. And, you know, one of the I guess that's something I never considered. And one of the things that really drew you to wanting to talk about this film in particular is the score, which is something yes. that adds so much to that comforting factor of this movie. I did not realize until I was doing research for this that the score is by James Horner. Yeah, one of one of my favorite composers, absolutely. Yeah. Oscar winner, Titanic for God's yep. sake, Titanic, <laughs> Avatar, Legends of the Fall. I confused oh my God. with last one. I gets... love that movie. Beautiful scores, uh, yeah. but yeah, Titanic and obviously Avatar being his last big score. But yeah, the score for this is is obviously has some you know zany elements, but the uh, the main theme, Casper's Lullaby, the whole sort of uh, nostalgic theme it, it's very weirdly heavy <laughs> it's, yes. it's very it, it sounds I, I saw heard someone describe it as it sounds like a memory and i thought that was so perfectly uh descriptive of, of that particular uh theme in, in the movie and the way he uses it and the way it it works in tandem with the the drama unfolding on the screen or, or in mentioning of, of their, their, uh, cat's mom who passed away. Mm. Um, really, really powerful, like really, and even on its own, that piece of music really has legs. And, and when it, when he shifts to it, as he's, you know, weaving this web throughout whatever cues you're listening to, it's enormously effective. And I, I think it's, I think it's one of James Horner's best scores, frankly. And I, I put, I might even put it, above like my favorite james horner score is the mask of zorro i think that's an incredible score but i I might even put this above that that's a bold statement (laughs) you know that like a memory that's absolutely how this how this score feels and it's incorporated pretty cleverly throughout the film as well but just that piano melody so simple so soft yeah is it sad Mm, a little yeah it's it sounds like regret 
hopeful Almost. too a little bit. Yeah. It's just um it's it's interesting how much you can accomplish with such a just a simple, you know, yeah, a, a simple arrangement of notes. I also have to mention <laughs> <laughs> the Jordan Hill pop classic song, Remember Me This Way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I It was written by David Foster and Linda Thompson. I love this song. We sang it yeah. in my high school choir and I, <laughs> I still remember the harmonies. It sounds like it was written for Mariah Carey. And oh, yeah. You listen to the full track, like you can see where Mariah would have taken this song for yep. sure. <laughs> it might have been a bigger hit. <laughs> I think it would have. I'm sure they probably wrote it with her in mind. She was at the peak of her, you know, peak of her fame at this point. Yeah. Well, listen, why don't we get into the film? Yeah. Yeah, let's dive in. So just a smallest bit of background about the character created by Seymour Wright. And uh, illustrated by Joe Oriolo originally, it was the character of Casper was conceived as a children's book, but no one was interested in publishing it. So Wright went away on military service during World War II, and while uh -huh. he was gone, Oriolo sold the rights to the book to Paramount Pictures, famous studios, for a hundred and seventy-five dollars flat. Oof! And that's it. That one-time payment was. All that either of them received, no revenue, no residuals for what would become a series of comic strips, comic books, cartoon series, like the cartoon shorts before movies, and then a series of feature films. And they got nothing. Harvey Comics ended up with the rights and, you know, the rest is history. I grew up with, we had a VHS tape of old uh, animated like cartoons and a couple of them were Casper and then there was a Wendy one and... Mm. And uh, did you grow up with the original Casper at all? I don't know. Uh, I, I know when we were growing up, they had uh, TV Land or the Cartoon Network. Maybe they had shown something at some point. Um, okay. I can picture it, but I don't really know if I did. So the movie did decently at the box office. It did more than decently. It did, it did pretty good. It got terrible reviews. A lot of yeah. the critics felt that it was a missed opportunity. The heir to the Harvey Comics estate hated the movie. Uh, he said that it was, it was kind of forced, like, unfri like child unfriendly humor, right? Sure, yeah. And just overly dark themes and really missed the opportunity to be something innocent. Whereas other critics said that it went too heavy and too dark for kids. But the kids loved it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what. I mean, I I get it because had they you know grown up with the cartoon and the comic strip, this is quite the departure from that. Very much so. But uh, I I could see people criticizing it for being overly saccharine. I could see people criticizing it for maybe being crude. But I feel like that was a lot of that '90s uh, sentiment of you know making you know quote unquote snide comments or you know, poop jokes or something in a movie, mm. no matter how innocent we're seen as like the biggest affront ever. <laughs> right. Like now, oh, completely. now it just shows how less innocent the world is now. Basis. It's kind of like, I, I hear a lot about this with the Simpsons where when the Simpsons came out, I was not allowed to watch it. Same. Because it was like, you know, so super crass and whatever. And I never really put the, the uh, connected the dots until I realized, Oh, my parents grew up with leave it to beaver and uh the waltons and things like that and that the simpsons was like punk rock yes i had no idea it was i thought it was just you know cartoon comedy so i guess looking at casper through the same lens yeah it was it was a little edgy it was a little 90s it had a uh, it was a little modern i guess you could say but I still think, yeah, it clearly resonated with us as kids. And, and I didn't have the connection with Casper that my parents may have. And, you know, they uh, I mean, th this film gets away with a lot for a PG rating. They, they use the word bitch twice. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, I think Kat says screw screw you or screw off. Uh, they say something about hell, like not the place, but like the curse word. It Doesn't gets away with piss off piss off that's it wow, yeah at that's the breakfast table one, yeah. yeah yeah so it gets away with with quite a bit but uh, whatever i don't know <laughs> whatever I don't it's care the 90s. <laughs> it's the 90s <laughs> this is the 90s yeah. all right so there was a proposed sequel theatrical sequel but that was dropped the kind of direction that that went instead was a cartoon series called the spooktacular new adventures of casper i had no idea that this existed me neither 
never saw it. It, it lasted for four seasons. So hmm. it did decently well. It feels a little bit like the Beetlejuice cartoon show. They just kind of sure. switched up the characters a little bit. There was a Super Nintendo video game where Casper is, you have to protect Cat as she walks through Whipstaff Manor. So you're huh. kind of like dot, like kind of dodging stuff and, and deflecting things that are trying to harm her. That's cool. And I don't know if you knew this, but there was a stage musical of Casper as well. Oh my God. Very- is it a theme park? <laughs> <laughs> no, and that was my first thought too. Very little is documented about it. Started out in London, which from what I could tell was in fact a brief West End production from 1999 to 2000. Holy cow. That version was about a uh, ghost hunting film crew that came into the manor. And except for Casper, all of the ghosts were puppets. Wow. Closed. And then in 2001, it was revived in Pennsylvania and it toured a little bit and get this it starred Cheetah Rivera in the villain role huh and a lot of the music had changed the ghosts were now actor live actors and not puppets and didn't go anywhere and then in 2019 the Children's Theater of Cincinnati did a production of it and those are the only documented ones wow there's a cast recording available on YouTube I'm not going to recommend you go listen to it, but <laughs> if you feel like you want to, feel free. It's there. Did they use the Horner score or was this all completely Not at all. New? Okay, not, yeah. not that I heard. I, I confess I didn't listen to the entire cast okay. recording. And I imagine Spielberg had nothing to do with this. No, I this, doubt it. Okay, but yeah. it used the logo from the film on the marquee yeah. in London. So it, it was this weird hybrid of of film adjacent marketing, Interesting. but having nothing else to do with the movie. Oh, I have no idea how they got those rights. What a, what a bitter journey for a beloved movie. <laughs> I know. I watched an interview. I fell into a black hole of Cheetah Rivera in Casper, and she gave an interview, and she's not unkind. She's, you know, promoting the show, but you can tell she knows that she's in a stinker. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, but she's not being rude about it. You know, she's being kind. She's promoting it. She's being positive, but in the behind her eyes. Yeah. I know the... Uh... Casper lived in the parks for a long time at Universal. Yeah. Um, I think in Florida is where they had the set, the Whipstaff Manor, I think, because I know they shot that Backstreet Boys video in it, and they also they shot did. Mystery Men in it. Oh, I didn't know Mystery um, Men. Yeah, that's... Uh, what's Jeffrey Rush's character? Uh, uh, Casanova Frankenstein's uh, manor is Whipstaff, is Whipstaff Manor. That's wild. Um, so they got a lot of use out of that. <laughs> it's a great set. Listen, it's, it's beautiful, a terrific yeah. set. We'll talk about it as we get to it. Let's just Absolutely. jump into the plot of the movie. Uh, so, well, and just one more thing about, uh, yeah, you mentioned Gaudi is the architect mm -hmm. that, that was inspired by for the mansion. They didn't want to do a typical kind of Victorian looking haunted house. So uh, they uh, utilized inspiration from this architect was from California and known as one of the best exponents of Catalan modernism. Mm. Not super familiar with what that means, but it's, it has a lot of Barcelonian influences. Oh, interesting. And not what you would expect from a haunted house. It's kind of more inviting, yeah. almost cartoonish in that it's very, it's rounded. It's not quite as angular. Yeah. It's like a welcoming whimsical. It's whimsical. That's the word. Very. Yeah. yeah. All the stained glass and things. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. Very colorful. A lot more colorful than a Victorian mansion would be i think yeah i think it would be a very different film if it and you know probably still enjoyable i love it i love a traditional yeah. haunted house what a wrong. unique what a unique those those beautiful matte paintings of the house and stuff yeah. it's just such a unique uh, yeah. I, it's iconic in the way that they did it you know they look like the adams family yeah yeah it's up there with that as far as like iconic spooky sets yeah so we open on a starry night outside of whipstaff manor there's a beautiful giant huge iron gate and the wind is rustling through the trees and two kids pull up on their bicycles. <laughs> the idea is, okay, we're gonna take one picture and then we're history. And then the other kid says, that's what I'm afraid of. And so they <laughs> break into the manor and they just wanna prove that they've been there. And they've got these flashlights and shining all over the place. It's super, super dark in there. And they keep arguing, who's gonna take the picture? I wanna take it. No, I wanna take it. And then we hear Casper's voice say, guys, guys, I'll take the picture, say cheese. And the Polaroid yep. picture is shot, it snaps, it falls to the ground and we see it develop during opening credits and these two kids are screaming. Oh, I love that opening so much. And it's talk about, we, we don't get title drops in movies anymore. Sure. 
where's the big title moment? Where, and I, I, you know, like, where the, what the hell? Where's the opening and then the title, you know, yep. I guess some people do it. But it's funny, interesting about that. I'm going to be talking a lot about the score because I know a little bit about it. Please do. The, uh, the, when, when, we, when we do, uh, when the photo is finally flashed and, and we go to the, the developing photo and the, the title reveal, there's an alternate cue originally that was the, uh, uh, sort of like the the A version of the Casper of Casper's theme in the movie, but they replaced it with the Casper the Friendly Ghost theme. Interesting. Like they did, they did two versions of that. So now it goes, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost. Da, 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 da. Originally, it was the I think. Um, that was what played there initially, but then I guess they probably realized they need to brand this thing a little more with with casper <laughs> a little bit it draws you in i uh i could see it going either way i guess absolutely I don't a, yeah yeah i, don't I have love a how it opinion. is for yeah sure. i do too C- because it takes what is kind of a spooky scene and makes it a little more fun it's just absolutely, such a, yeah. a fun like kind of happy tune oh yeah i love it such a spielbergian opening too that's true and you know what a lot of people compared this movie not in like the same level of filmmaking but it, a lot of it is his his uh, he served as producer mm-hmm. his approach to et right and mm-hmm. uh, kind of tugging at heartstrings the way that et does it got some comparisons to that so mm-hmm. we cut to ben stein the first of many cameos giving his monotonous deadpan yep. delivery of reading a will of the deceased to the daughter of said deceased. Her name is Kerrigan, played by the wonderful Kathy Moriarty, who has some of the best dialogue of her career, I think. Oh, she's fabulous in this. Is, was she, wasn't she nominated for an Oscar? Was, was it Raging Bull? I think it was Raging yeah, Bull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, we need her back. She's so talented. I assume she's still around. I and, think and she was on a couple episodes of Ryan Murphy's Versace show. Oh, cool, cool. I did not watch it, but <laughs> I think think that's what i had heard uh but you know let's uh, let's give her something more than that uh, so she's he's listing all of these lavish donations to charities and they're getting a little more and more ridiculous one of them is dyslexic dalmatians foundation and kerrigan is pissed because when it comes time for her she's only getting left whip staff manor mm-hmm. she, she says i spent the last two days holding his clammy hand waiting for him to die <laughs> All I get is this lousy piece of property. That is all we need to know about the character. It's fabulous. In like two sentences. <laughs> and then so Ben Stein tells her it was lousy 50 years ago. Now it's condemned. She's mad. He leaves. She grabs the folder that he's given her and throws it into the fireplace. And when she does, the invisible ink starts to appear on the deed. And so her partner in... I don't really, what is their arrangement? I I assume he's like somehow her advisor or I hesitate to say attorney. It's almost as if maybe it's her assistant, her sad assistant. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. He does almost in a weird, weird way function as an either an accountant or an attorney. Yeah. It's super unclear. I, there's kind of this like back and forth hatred where you're sure they've probably did they sleep together? I don't know. They just clearly hate each other, but they're working together. Regrettably possible. Regrettably yeah, sure. <laughs> possible. So he says, no, that's the deed. And they bend down to pick it up. And this invisible ink has revealed that uh, a, a sentence. And it says kind of the end of a sentence and buried gold. Lipstaff does a treasure hold. Mm-hmm. And she kind of changes her tune. And um, Dibs has burned his hand in the fire. Yep. And she grabs his hand and pulls him away. He says, I think I need a doctor. She grabs his hand and says, there's plenty in Maine. This is the first of many physical abuses and verbal abuses that she's going to. Oh, she's horrible to poor Eric Idle. Bestow upon him. And he's, you know, I know he said that he hates it. He does seem a little bored, but he's also really enjoyable in this movie. Oh, yeah. I, I think every, everyone in this performs wonderfully, I think. So I'm, I'm sad to hear he doesn't look fondly at this you know actually i should mention kathy moriarty appeared in one of the sequels in casper meets wendy a direct video sequel hillary oh duff's first movie she <gasps> plays one of her witch aunts with oh, terry wow. gar with terry gar and shelly duvall oh, those are, oh wow those are huge names i'm gonna have to yeah. check that out it's on youtube it was one that i really enjoyed when i was a kid and i don't 
know if I need to recommend it now. <laughs> doesn't hold up. Yeah. Doesn't hold up, man. Yeah. The CGI alone, they did not have the same budget. Before Oof. that, there was Casper, A Spirited Beginning, which was supposed to serve as a prequel, but conflicts with the timeline of this movie. Steve Gutenberg and, um, oh, hell, what's her name? Aunt Becky from Full House. Oh, shoot. Um, Lori Loughlin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, so they also, tried. They tried. They tried. Both direct video. I, 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 I watched them both. I remember them both. Don't need to see them again. All right. <laughs> so they pull up to Whipstaff and Kerrigan makes Dibs get out of the car to open the gate in the pouring rain. And then she just drives off and doesn't let him back in the car. <laughs> I love keeping track of how mean she is to him. They go inside and she calls it a dump. It's dark inside. We hear Casper say hello. And, you know, are you the caretaker? No. Are you a transient? No. Just show yourself. And then Kathy Moriarty says, cut the crap and uh, threatens to arrest him. So Casper slides down the banister and flies in front of their faces, says, hi, I'm Casper. And so, all right, let's talk about his computer animation. Yeah. He is the first fully computer animated lead character of a movie literally ever is that right yes holy cow isn't that wild wow. there had been computer animated characters not for like a lead uh there yeah. are 40 minutes worth of cgi shots in this film that's wild. which is super impressive i have to say it looks pretty good it absolutely holds up i was actually just watching the blu-ray earlier and i was blown away by how uh good it looks and i think what helps is that they were very cartoony yes they were cartoony. supposed to look yeah and, the, and the, translucent. Trans, yes the translucent <laughs> nature and i gotta say the translucentness i love that it it you know toward their facial features it's more opaque mm -hmm. uh, or, and then kind of becomes less and less so the further back yeah. and then from behind they might be a lot more see-through it's uh it's pretty clever it works yeah. for me it worked Heavily for me then detailed. and it still does yeah, and, Jura and this was 95, I think, when Casper yes. came out. Jurassic Park came out in 93. So that's a short amount of time to make a very huge advancement in, in CG like that. And yeah, yeah, Jurassic Park had maybe 15 minutes of CG. Right. Compared animals in it. Yeah. 40. And yeah. there are moments where there are items that Casper might be holding that are also CG. Yes. That I like when he serves them pancakes, those are CG pancakes. Yep. But they look super good. He's holding the elixir at one point, and it goes back and forth between being animated and not. And if you look for it, look for it. You're gonna see it, but it's so seamless. It, oh yeah, it's a real, it's a real accomplishment. Yeah, not to mention all the practical stuff they had to interact with on the set. You know, pages blowing, thing, you know, curtains moving when they fly by them. All this stuff had to be triggered and animated live because you know now they would do it completely in a computer. <laughs> I bet it was fun. I bet it was oh, a yeah, fun set with all of the practical gags that are going on. Actually, Bill Pullman and Christina Ricci interacted with tennis balls on sticks to oh. know to, to have their sight lines of where yeah. they should be looking when they're talking to these ghosts. I love that. And uh it it works. You know, Christina Ricci does not speak, she did not speak fondly of this movie shortly after she made it. She kind of trashed it. Oh. And um to this day, to my understanding, I, I think she more regrets her performance and how disinterested she was in the movie as she was making it. But she was also 15 and I I, yeah. I didn't listen to the interview, but she kind of gives herself a little bit of grace about that. She hasn't trashed the movie. She wishes that she maybe had been more present for it, but. She was certainly year, not too many years away from doing more serious stuff. Um, and that was, she and was it, trying to work into that. Yeah. yeah. And she was stuck in that kid actor uh, yeah. phase of her career. Because but here yeah, she's you know. 15 playing 13. And I think that that's an age oh. difference where like she probably, you know, 13 is super childish to a 15 year old. Yeah. I didn't track that at all. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's whatever age she is. And I assume yeah. she's like 16 or something. Yeah. Roughly 13 from what I, from what I understood. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Kathy or <laughs> Kerrigan and Dibs vacate. They scream and run away. But the very next morning, they hire a series of experts to try to get rid of these ghosts. The first mm -hmm. of which is probably the most obscure 90s reference <laughs> of all of them. It's Father Guido Sarducci, played by Don Novello <laughs> from SNL. This was an SNL character that, frankly, has not stood the test of time. Like, yeah. I don't think I knew who this part character was in the nineties and we I watched had SNL. No idea. I had no idea who that was. Yeah. I, I, the SNL I remember is the Will Ferrell, Anna Gasteyer, okay. Molly Shannon like that. That's the, I assume that was the nineties still. 
pretty sure. Like Sherry O'Terry. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I'd we say all that's, know those. Yeah. I think I may have just missed Guido Sarducci or was he more late eighties? I'm not sure. I don't know either. He yeah. enters the house. He's got this whole, Oh, no problem. Piece of cake thing that he that's <laughs> that's his shtick. He walks into the house. We hear the sounds of vomit. He walks out covered in green slime yeah. with his head on backwards. We're referencing the exorcist here. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he couldn't get rid of the ghosts. We cut to Dan Aykroyd dressed as Ray Stance from effing Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. And he runs out of the house and he says, who are you going to call? Someone else. And he runs away. Such a great moment. So good. It was actually, this moment got a lot of buzz because this was the time when, in particular, where everyone was begging for Ghostbusters 3. (sighs) And we wouldn't get that until, like, what, three years ago? Four years ago now? Oh, my God. Too late. Too much too too late. late. Far too late. Even as a kid, though, I thought that was the coolest. Yeah. You know, I know who that is. I have no idea who these other people are. I know the Ghostbusters. Dan Aykroyd has confirmed that it is considered canon in the Ghostbusters world. I love that. He tried to exercise the ghostly trio and could could not. (laughs) Uh, They filmed a shot, a a scene with Zelda Rubenstein from Poltergeist. (gasps) And it was going to be her shooting out of the chimney. As she's doing that, she's shouting, go toward the light. And That's in hilarious. her weird, go toward the light voice. And they cut it for pacing. But damn, like you had Zelda Rubenstein and you're not going to use her? That's not a that's not on a deleted scene anywhere, is it? I not, doubt it. Not that I could find. That's a real shame. Yeah. Speaking of horror icons. Yeah. So truly. So Kerrigan says, what do I usually do when something stands in my way? And we cut to a giant wrecking ball. And she's going to just tear the house down. If these ghosts won't get out so she can look for this treasure, she's just going to tear it down. But the ghosts frighten the construction workers out of the building in a very cartoonish, comical, jumping over the railing, sliding down the stairs, jumping into a car, like all of them piling into and on top of a car and driving away. And we see Casper fly out of the mansion and he's asking them, don't be afraid. And it's so the, the voice actor for Casper had never worked in a film before. They, they saw something like 500 children for this role. Wow. And I, I think that they found the perfect person. He's so earnest, but so um, like, he's just got the perfect amount of like 12 year old smart ass with innocence. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah, his 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 performance in it. It's, I'm surprised he didn't go on to do anything, any other voice work. Did he do any other Casper stuff, or was that the only? I don't believe that he went on to play Casper yeah, anymore. I guess I he think... probably because he he was maybe turning whatever teenage years. So at that point, maybe he lost him, that, that childish voice. As, voice is what changing. Happens. That's what happens yeah. in the voice of Nemo and Finding Nemo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Couldn't it's, he uh... couldn't do Finding Dory? You got to get in and get out. <laughs> I think they let him voice another character, if I'm not mistaken, in Finding Dory, which I thought was pretty cool. So That's cool of them. we uh, cut to Casper flipping channels on the TV. We see Mr. Raj- Rogers talking about having friends. And then there's a Daffy Duck cartoon uh, where Daffy sees a ghost and has a cartoonish response. <laughs> and then he flips to hard copy, which is another very 90s thing. Yep. <laughs> I, we don't have hard copy anymore, right? I don't think so. Yeah. And uh, the real life newscaster on hard copy is introducing a story about Dr. James Harvey, ghost therapist. Uh, he works with the living impaired. And, uh, you know, he says they need help sometimes, just like the rest of us. And his wife, Amelia, died. We found, found, we find out. And when that happened, he gave up conventional psychiatry and some say conventional sanity. <laughs> and he drags his daughter, Kat, short for Kathy, around with him. And we cut to this weird, awkward, cameraman accosting Kathy on the yeah, high school, like, school basketball court. And she says, please leave me alone. And it, it's, it's no one would ever do that. I would hope to a child, or at least they would need some kind of permission to put her on TV, whatever. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. Casper gets this idea, right? He wants a friend. He's lonely. And he gets this idea to bring this other lonely potential friend to him by showing this to Kerrigan. So Mm -hmm. he travels through the telephone wires to the local motel and turns on the TV in Kerrigan's hotel room. And she's bitching about room service on the phone with the front desk. And she's in a robe with a towel on her head. And uh, Casper, like magically, not magically, he wheels the TV in front of her. I love her reaction when she sees the TV. 
oh yeah like she is a i i don't i'm gonna gush about her this whole movie please yeah she brings a caliber of of comedic performance to this film that I'm, I'm just really grateful for her a long list of other actors were considered including like nicole kidman and um oh wow yeah 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 it's i i'm glad we got who we got so anyway yeah. uh she watches this story about dr harvey on tv and tells the front desk man, get me Santa Fe, because that's where Dr. Harvey is now with his daughter. And we cut to Dr. James Harvey and Kat driving around in the desert. They have accepted the job from Miss Kerrigan, and they're going to move to Maine and stay at Whipstaff Manor and help these ghosts cross over so that she can access her home. Mm hmm. Cat, set to uh, that's life set to that's Absolutely. life which i literally only realized is funny today because this movie is about dead people <laughs> i don't I, know i clocked that as i was watching it earlier too <laughs> okay i'm glad i wasn't oh, the was only brilliant. one all right yep. <laughs> so we we find that cat has been being teased at the last school for her dad being an afterlife therapist they're <laughs> going to move to this town called friendship maine uh, amity and the, yeah exactly they have this back and forth where he tells you you sound like your mother and she gets really real with him. And this is what you were talking about where they are. They are very much like peers in this movie. Mm -hmm. She tells him, you're not going to find her. Mom's not a ghost. Mm -hmm. And he, his response is, yes, she is. She has unfinished business. And then she tells him there's no such things as ghosts, but a couple of things happen here, right? We will find out later what has happened to their mom. And Kat is not wrong. She's not mm -hmm. a ghost. Right. And then he, is he mentions her unfinished business. That's what leaves. That's what keeps ghosts in the living realm in the human on earth. Instead of crossing over is that rather than moving on, they decide to stick around. So he stops the car and looks her in the eyes and he tells her this is going to be the last time. If we don't find what we're looking for, then no more moving, no more ghost hunting. And they pinky promise on it. And mm -hmm. it is understood that that's kind of, you know, a done deal. So they turn around and they head to Maine and they get there and they drive through this beautiful quaint town. It was filmed in Camden and they meet Kerrigan and Dibs outside and they're weird with cat. They like pinch her face and yeah, <laughs> it's a lot it's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, we find that uh, James says it might take years to get rid of these ghosts and Kerrigan's response is days conceivable weeks, maybe months, no years impossible. She says, get them out and tells them they'll be watching very closely and they leave. So Kat and James go into Whipstaff and Casper notices, you know, he's so excited. What if she likes me? What if she doesn't? Hey, I'm Casper. I'm going to try and, you know, working mm -hmm. himself up to introduce himself. They go down to the basement to get the lights turned on. And James thinks he's done it, but it turns out it was Kat who did it. Installing 20 amps. And I don't know, she says some electrician mumbo jumbo <laughs> that I don't understand. But it's this moment where we realize Kat's taking care of herself. He's not, yeah. he's, he's, he's grief stricken. And like you said, he's bumbling, right? I like how he's, he's the, he, she was left with the parent who doesn't know how to be a parent and yeah. he's very work obsessed and he's very, um, maybe a little bit of a child himself still. I think so. And yeah. very, he's just lost without his wife. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. She was the compass. Sure. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, she goes off to find her room, but before she does, she, uh, so this staircase that winds around one side and another staircase that winds around the other side of this massive ballroom and meets on a balcony in the middle, climbs these stairs, finds one bedroom that has three beds in it. And the he headboards <laughs> read stretch, fatso, and stinky. And Kat mm -hmm. remarks, they had cruel parents and I wonder where Doc and Do Dopey sleep. Love that. I Love do that too. Line. She finds her bedroom and the ceiling is so cool. Like this was my dream bedroom as a child. She has this oh, cool yeah. bay window. And then the ceiling is like a swirl. It's like, like whipped cream on top of pie, but in reverse with like a <laughs> skylight in the middle of it. Yeah. This is all, it, it, it Gaudi, is that twenties architecture? Is that kind know. of, a, it feels like that might be, it's just weird opulence. Yes. Like just before everything went to hell. Yeah. And <laughs> that ceiling yeah. is, is based on one of his actual works. Oh, wow. Like, like almost directly lifted from it. Oh, I love that. So she has found her room and she lays down and Casper's really excited because there's a girl on his bed. <laughs> and uh, so James comes up the stairs. He's bringing a box of her stuff 
And Casper, <laughs> this is where Casper's trying to introduce himself, but he's not able to. James opens a closet and Casper's there like, hi, but he drops the box on Casper and he unpacks a picture of Amelia. Oh, and yeah. there's this uh, tender, vulnerable moment between Kat and James. And she takes it and yeah. says, mom belongs over here and puts it on her nightstand. Yeah. First time um, we hear the theme. Is that it? Yeah, that's the, the I guess we'll call it the longing theme. Kind okay. Of, uh, that dun, 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 dun. It's interesting that they assigned it to... Um, to Kat's mom in that, in that place. Cause it's usually it's, it's actually, no, I, I guess it, I guess it does. It, it works for both Casper and Kat and it really, yeah, it is kind of the memory theme, the longing theme. It's yeah. whenever we mention, or we're in a scene that has to do with loss. Yeah. Yeah. It's holy cow. Is that effective? <laughs> it is. It instantly yeah. hits you. Oh yeah. It, it's just one of those melodies that you feel it immediately. Yeah. He kisses her on the cheek goodnight and tells her, we're going to be glad we came, you watch. And Kat rolls a sleeping bag on her bed and lays down and Casper is like her pillow. He's like <laughs> behind her head and she fluffs him and punches him in the face. And she gets up to unpack more restlessly. And he's coming up behind her and he's about to introduce himself and she throws a boot behind her and it <laughs> lands in his mouth. And when he spits it out, it hits her on the head. So she turns around and sees him and she faints. Yep. Casper goes to the sink, fills himself up with water like a sponge, then brings himself out on her face and she wakes up and screams. Casper disappears. James runs into the room. And now Kat, who was never a believer, is <clears throat> trying to tell her dad, I saw a ghost. I, I don't want you to think I'm as crazy as I thought that you were, but please, I promise, <laughs> I saw a ghost. And I really think it's interesting that he doesn't believe her here. Yeah, that is interesting. This guy who totally believes in ghosts. Maybe, maybe, maybe she's pulled you know, pranks on him before we can only assume I mean, making fun of him. Maybe, but I think he also just, uh, he, um, he just doesn't take her as seriously. Uh, he, the, the, a lot of this movie is him letting go of her growing up. That's true. Right. Yep. Because he even does the whole, Oh, opens the closet door. Nothing's in here and looks yeah, under the bed. Like and there's nothing kid. under here. Like you would to like, yeah, I kid. And she makes a face like she is not having it. But, you know, she is the, his biggest skeptic. And when she's swearing up and down, she has a ghost, sees a ghost. <laughs> he doesn't believe it. Anyway, uh, he opens another closet door and there's Casper. And Casper finally says, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. And James <laughs> screams and he's running down the hallway. He's got cat like kind of over his shoulder and they hide in a closet. And she's, you know, apologizing. I'm so sorry. I never believed you. So. Here we are introduced finally to the ghostly trio. Ah, uh, yes. This is a was... genuinely terrifying introduction. <laughs> they they um, arrive having just come from horse races. And so one of them is holding like a horse racing trophy. Another one's got a cigar in his mouth. And then the other one's got like a laurel like you would put around a winning horse's neck. And uh, so we instantly know that these guys are, are scamps. And they are <laughs> gamblers and they're very crude. They yes, sir are. Uh, these were not the original characters as they appeared in the comics and cartoons. Fatso uh, is the same name, but I guess they didn't want to pay for licenses for too many characters to make this movie. That's actually why Wendy doesn't appear. She was supposed oh. to be in this movie originally, but they didn't want to pay for her. So they changed Lazo and Fusso to Stretch and Stinky. So Lazo was like lazy, right? And then Fusso was very persnickety and fussy. So, you know, actually a really a funny fact is that the Harvey Comics uh, sued Ghostbusters for $50 million because the logo for Ghostbusters resembled Fatso in their design. No kidding. But they lost because they hadn't renewed the copyright. So... <laughs> <laughs> which you know mickey mouse is up for i i haven't super followed it but his his uh trademark is ending like the i don't know how it works disney has the best lawyers in the world they're not gonna yeah. lose the rights to mickey mouse i'm sure they're gonna be okay i'm sure they'll, they'll maintain uh we might see some junky mickey mouse merchandise out there but uh i'm sure for the most part it'll remain in disney's clutches i mean that merchandise already exists in every strip mall in the orlando Absolutely. <laughs> in lake Buena oh, vista florida gosh. vicinity it i have noticed they're they're using a lot more oswald the rabbit oh 
which uh, is is interesting. I don't know if that has to do with trying to renew him as well, regardless. Probably. So I think I might have forgotten to mention before that the ghostly trio kind of already made an entrance when Kerrigan and Dibs first come into the house. They appear in this kind of swirling tornado of ghostly ectoplasm, and that's what frightens Kerrigan and Dibs out of the house, right? That's right. That's right. Now we finally get to know them. We see them in their original form, their ghostly form. <laughs> And, you know, they're accosting Casper. Why aren't you doing your chores? Where's dinner? And Casper is trying to keep them from going in the house because he doesn't want them to scare away James and Cat, right? Mm -hmm. And so he suggests, let's eat outside. Al fresco. It's a harvest moon. It'll be nice. But <laughs> they uh, aren't buying it. They play him like an accordion and then they shoot him up into the sky and then they fly into the house and they smell that someone's there, but it's not stinky. <laughs> <laughs> So we cut to James, who's walking the halls, and he's calling out to these spirits, I'd like to make contact with you. Please don't scare me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, let me approach you first. And he's he's got, like, two fingers ahead of him, like a priest would bless things with. And, of course, they pop out of nowhere, and they scare the hell out of him. They get these really scary faces with sharp fang teeth and yeah. red eyes and it's genuinely kind of genuinely terrifying the only the only genuinely horror moment in this movie for true. sure that's very true well until a couple seconds later they dive into his mouth and then he wakes up when he hears cat calling him and he goes to the sink to splash water on his face ah uh, yes we get is a little bit poltergeisty when he peels the guy peels his face off in the mirror but from here he transforms into three celebrities now i have read that these celebrities kind of are supposed to be what these ghosts look like in their human form. So the first one is Clint Eastwood. Oh. And the the rumor is that he is to be Stretch. Oh. And Rodney Dangerfield is Fatso. And then Mel Gibson would be Stinky. <laughs> Here's the thing. Like, we're talking about 90s references and how stuck in 1995 this movie is. Like, Eastwood and Gibson probably didn't age super well as far as like their cultural significance and cultural appropriateness. And then yeah. Rodney Dangerfield just kind of fell off the face of the earth. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. He was a funny fellow, though. And then our fourth guy. Fourth guy is the Crypt Keeper. Yeah. And uh, he actually, the Crypt Keeper from Tales from the Crypt, he slaps his face and screams just like Kevin in Home Alone. Yeah. They oh, did man. film a Steven Spielberg cameo but they cut it for pacing. He was going to be another person that uh, he transforms into in the mirror. And he says to this day, he's really glad that they cut it because he didn't have any faith in his acting ability. Oh, do we know what he said or, or did? Don't know. Oh man. I know. How wild. It's another kind of like Zelda Rubenstein, like give us the footage. We deserve to see it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That Crypt Keeper moment. I remember as a kid, because I, I was not we didn't have HBO or anything, but when and when Kelsey Crypt was syndicated on Fox, okay, I'm pretty sure I, that's, where, that's where I caught it. But I was always Crypt Keeper kind of freaked me out. It's kind of like Freddy Krueger, and just the look of him was like, "Who is that? <laughs> Why is totally. he so frightening?" But there Wasn't, was something also so inviting about him. Yeah, and appealing. I mean, the voice actor behind him is he not the same actor that voiced SpongeBob? Am I crazy? No, uh, John Cassier did uh, the Crypt Keeper. SpongeBob was um, I'm Tom Kenny. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, still voiced a plethora of incredibly oh yeah important and recognizable characters. So I was familiar with the Crypt Keeper. I knew what Tales from the Crypt was. Was not allowed to watch it at the time, but there was a Same. there was a cartoon show that I remember. Yes, I think it was called Tales from the Crypt Keeper. Yeah. Was, yeah. 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 I, I don't know that I that. did. You really? I don't know that yeah. I was allowed to even watch that. Yeah, it was uh, it was all right. It was kind of creepy. Uh, it, it kind of felt like Mighty Max, sort of in the same kind of. Oh man, I forgot style. about Mighty Max. Yeah, Mighty Max. Holy cow! Yeah, I love me some Mighty Max. <laughs> Bring all back right, Mighty Max. Let's but, do. Uh, yeah, yeah, we Crypt deserve Keeper that reboot. Was like that mysterious, like, what is this? I know I, we don't have it. I'm not allowed to watch it. But every Halloween at my friend's house, uh, it would be on Fox. Yeah, they would have some cleaned up version of it. And it was always the intro specifically with the haunted house and everything was always so like uh, captivating Incredible. and terrifying. <laughs> That's Danny Elfman who did the score to the it intro, is. right? Yeah, yeah, such an iconic Absolutely intro. Absolutely iconic. All right, so Kat's running around the house. It's a funny moment. The fatso bounces her with his belly back into a closet and he says, hey boys, we've got a closet case here. <laughs> Just... So James ends up falling down the stairs and rolling himself up in the carpet as he does. When he reaches the bottom, he then unrolls out of the carpet. It's a very cartoonish gag that looks pretty cool when done in a practical, you know, 
sense. And uh, the uncles start chasing him with swords and he uh, gets a plunger and now they're having a sword fight. Oh, and yeah. uh, I think the music here is incredible. It's so good. It's yeah. so good. It's uh, James Horner basically doing uh, corn gold and like the old Robin Hood scores from the 1940s and Captain Blood and the Seahawk and all that stuff. It's really great. If you listen to those, it's fantastic. Very specific style for sure. Oh, yeah. I think the the ghostly trio does kind of a all for one one for all yeah. gag as well. <laughs> Uh, which I think Three Musketeers had probably come out pretty recently as well. The Disney oh, version. That was early 90s, I think. Yeah, it was that was really terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> that dungeon yeah. scene was so scary. Oh, yeah. All right. So while he's fighting the ghosts off, James introduces himself. And we got this great shot of him fighting up one staircase while Kat's running down another staircase. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Stinky, like, stinks into James's oh, face. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a belch basically with this green mist and so he ends gross. up passing out. But when he comes to, he grabs a vacuum cleaner and he sucks all the ghosts into it. Fatso's yeah. last, he barely fits into the hose of the vacuum cleaner. And before he does, he says, this sucks. Oh, that was the most 90s, yeah. <laughs> so 90s. We get to, we cut to a really beautiful, like matte painting of Whipstaff on a seaside cliff. The ocean oh, is yeah. sparkling below. I mean, it's, it's really pretty. Oh, and yeah. And I wish we got a little bit more of that, but I'll enjoy what we got. Cat enters a room, Dustbuster first. I think it's funny. Remember Dustbuster? <laughs> uh, Dustbuster, yeah. I, that's a great moment, too, that would, it enters the frame through the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Casper says hi, and he wraps himself around her face, like around her mouth to keep her from screaming. He mm -hmm. says, please promise you won't scream. You're going to wake up my uncle's. And Kat agrees, but she comments when he removes himself from her, like wrapping around her face, he, she says, you're so cold. Mm -hmm. Casper invites her to sit down at the table. And um, she says, I can see right through you. And he says, well, that's what happens when you don't have any skin. <laughs> and we get this interesting com conversation where we're talking about the dynamics of what a ghost is in this mm -hmm. particular representation right she says uh what are you made out of and he says well the kind of you know the tingly feeling when your foot falls asleep i think i'm made of that his answers are that. vague but poetic yeah you know? very beautifully written casper makes her eggs and uh they have an egg cracking machine implying that there's some kind of inventor in the house a little reminiscent of like doc in um totally in, yeah yeah in um, back to the future back to the future that whole yeah, opening Rube goldberg sequence. machine yeah yeah yep. he it's it's cute while he's cooking he pours a glass of orange juice but he uses his ghost hand to strain the pulp out while the <laughs> yeah. juice pours through and then he throws it at the wall it's a mix of practical and cgi that really really works it looks oh it's incredible terrific. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so much of this. The, the the sword fighting scene you mentioned before, too, just the fact that he was fighting nothing and they had these floating yeah. things. And then you mentioned before that they transitioned between CG and not CG uh, props. So it's pretty remarkable for 1995. Totally. Completely agree. She asks, can you go invisible? And he says, that one's easy. And he brings her the glass of orange juice while he's invisible. It's almost like when the predator goes invisible, you can, we yeah. can still kind of see his outline a little bit. And, you know, this is just them exploring each other. Can I hurt you? No. Can you hurt me? No. And then yep. they reach through each other's hands and it's the, we get that beautiful longing score, right? The, yeah. The cue the that you mentioned. Yep. Mm -hmm. A couple interesting things are happening here. So, you know, they're becoming friends. They're getting to know each other. I also noticed this dialogue is a little bit of like consent. He tells her, go ahead, you can do this. And she asks, can I hurt you? Will this hurt? Like, it's just a really cool dialogue about two young people, like being comfortable with each other. Mm-hmm. And I know mm -hmm. that that was probably not the intention, but I, I'm re it's a read that I noticed. It may have been because I, I mean, it's unavoidably a little bit of a love story too. this this whole thing. And uh, um, yeah, it's just, it's just really beautifully written and you have the music and just the the way it's shot. And it's also obviously setting the rules for the whole universe. Like, OK, mm -hmm. what what can cannot happen in our in the frame of our movie? Um, like it can stretch and stinky. All these guys actually like rip someone apart no okay good <laughs> so, right yeah <laughs> but it's, it's a great scene yeah this movie it, it really is it, extremely touching um i think sometimes in ways that it even surprises itself a little i bit. think you know what that's a great point for sure yeah christina ricci when she was around this age shortly after she mentioned that it was a weird movie because casper is like 50 years old and he's got a crush on this 13 year old girl but weird. like yeah. uh yes 
but also I, you know, he's kind of trapped in the age that he died in. Yes. A hundred. He's know? eternally, eternally 12. 12 or something. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's totally admissible. I, I, it doesn't honestly, doesn't weird me out that much because I get it. And it's a fairy tale. It's a fantasy and stuff. Um, but uh, it's very sweet because it's innocence. It's all around innocence. There's nothing, you know, uh, it's very benign and not uh, cynical, which is what I really like about it. Yeah. Story. Yeah. So Dr. Harvey enters. He's at first afraid and uneasy of Casper, but Casper mm-hmm. makes him breakfast. He asks Kat, are you OK? Which I think and she says, yeah, which is, you know, kind of cool. Makes him this giant stack of pancakes, and then he offers a newspaper from Hong Kong, and he flies away to go get it. At this point, the uncle's helicopter quote in uh, while <laughs> singing Flight of the Valkyries yeah. and land at the table. And of course, quoting Apocalypse Now, he says, I love the smell of flesh. He's in the morning, stretched does. And he, when he bangs his fist on the table, the blinds go up, and they are bathed in sunlight, and mm. they start to melt, almost like the <laughs> Wicked Witch, yeah. you know, in Wizard of Oz. James and Cat are like, what the hell? Did they just die? Did we, did we just kill the ghosts? <laughs> but of course, they are fine. It's a joke. Casper returns and Stretch starts yelling at him because breakfast is not ready. And Casper <laughs> from the pantry brings these giant plates of like sweets and pastries and dessert foods. Yeah, which looked and incredible. It looks so tasty. I know. <laughs> yeah. And they start it looks delicious. eating it. And when they chew it, it just drops out of their bodies and lands on the floor. All so vile. Chewed up and yeah. gross. When I was a kid, I thought that was poo, to be honest. But I know it's just supposed to be a masticated food because uh, they have no digestive system. But I for sure thought that. I was like, wow, that's a lot. Well, in a minute when us. they fling it. It looks like poo, but it we'll, certainly does. We'll get to that. Uh, they yell at Casper because he's <laughs> sweeping up on the floor and he says, We have company. And I like the, I think it's uh, Stretch. He's kind of the leader of the ghostly trio. He says, mm-hmm. Well, company loves misery. And Kat stands up for Casper here, uh, which is cool. We're strengthening their bond, right? And she's oh, like, yeah. He's just trying to clean up and they have a, a tete a tete, so to speak, you know, drop dead. Too late. Piss off. Get a grave. And great comebacks. Casper kind of drags her out of the out of the kitchen. We are left with Harvey mm-hmm. telling them finish your meal, and then we'll meet in my office, and we'll start the process of crossing over. What do you say? And then they fling brown all over him, and that's <laughs> yes. where it looks like they just fling poo all over. Him. <laughs> that's where they got that PG rating. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Pushing it a little. Which, by the way, speaking of food, I have to mention: Did you have the Pizza Hut figures? Uh, yes, I had. Guys? Yeah, yep. you know what? It's yep. a very specific texture of plastic, and it smells. And it <laughs> smell. It's exactly <laughs> yes. what I was gonna say. A very like that new. Which here's the thing. I love that new plastic. Yeah, kind of ethanol-y yeah. smell. I can't help it. It's just. Yeah. It, yeah, I absolutely. That's was so, so cool. I remember old sit down Pizza Hut, which I actually have a Pizza Hut lamp in the background over there. The, uh, I saw Tiff, your Tiffany image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I have that same. Uh, uh, is that a jack o' lantern pillow? Yeah, I, I have the ex- a couple gifts. Yeah, exact same one on my bed. Actually, that's so funny. Awesome. Yeah, I'm starting to bring it all out. Good. Um, but I remember that sit down Pizza Hut so clearly. And back in Illinois, where I'm from, I remember going to that Pizza Hut uh, around 1995, and they were promoting Casper, and it was all the Pepsi stuff, and it was the figures. I remember we brought those home. We got all of them. Nice. And years later, maybe like I don't know, eight years later, when we were going through storage, we we found them, and they reeked. <laughs> so bad I don't know, whatever <laughs> awful toxic you know glow in the dark stuff that was on them yeah but i've thought about buying them on ebay again because they're, they're up there isn't that funny I, yeah. I i am the same way about trying to replace my childhood toys with oh, the yeah. same childhood toy. <laughs> i just want to see it even if i get rid of it in like a week and like resell it, i just want to like see it and be like yeah this this was it yep. <laughs> that's what it looked like yep. yep yep we cut to cat walking to school this girl on a bike uh, yells watch it and we find out her name is amber and this boy on a bike follows and he kind of gives her uh, gives cat eyes Mm -hmm. And uh, hey, Amber, wait up. So he's kind of Amber's tag along. We're going to get to know Amber in a moment. Cat is at school, can't get her locker open. And this uh, nice boy, we think he's nice, helps her out and says, I used to have that locker last year. And his name is Vic. And then Amber, this snotty girl, marks her territory all over. (laughs) And uh, now Cat has instantly made an enemy in Amber without even doing anything. Yep. In class, we learn... And it's it's Kat's first day. We learned that the asbestos removal in the gym is taking longer than they thought. So they're <laughs> going to have to push back the Halloween dance by a couple of months, which clearly means it's not happening. Yeah. 
Amber stands up and says, her parents' new boathouse has been remodeled. Let's just have the dance at my house. And nobody wants to. It's clear. (laughs) It's clear they're sick of hearing about how rich she is. Kat is asked to come to the front of the class and introduce herself. The teacher gets her name wrong. He calls her Harvey Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she as she approaches the front of the class, which why do teachers make kids do this? That's the worst thing. I know. But she sees Casper hiding in a poster of Mount Rushmore. Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and she inter- introduces herself as Cat, and Amber meows, and the kids all laugh at her. They're so shitty. And so Casper starts tying everyone's shoelaces together without them knowing it. Oh, yes. But she mentions that, you know, she's new in town, moved here with her father, and she's living at Whipstaff, and everyone's stop snickering. <laughs> and, you know, you've heard of it. And a kid says, you actually live there? So the student suggests that they have the dance at Whipstaff. And Amber's instantly mad because now the party's not going to be at her house. And yeah. so they take a vote. Nobody wants to go to Amber's place. Dance is going to be at Whipstaff. Cat had no say in this whatsoever. And uh, the bell rings. And when the kids stand up, everyone falls down because Casper tied their shoelaces together. That's so great. What a great button on a scene, too. Just like out. Boom. Yeah. Um, and also, Harvey Kathleen sounds like a punk rock band. I would <laughs> that's, absolutely that's really go to that name. show. In a that's heartbeat, a really would... cool name. Yeah. yeah. All right. So back at Whipstaff Manor, the ghosts are in session with Dr. Harvey, as it oh, were, yes. and they're just being unruly and they're not listening to him. And they find a picture of Amelia, mm-hmm. Dr. Harvey's deceased wife. And the conversation heads in a direction of the ghosts know her. And uh, Stinky specifically says, she's always been an angel to me. James asks, can they get a message to her? And the uncles get really serious. Mm -hmm. And they say, listen, if you can keep Kerrigan off of our backs, then we've got a deal. So he says, sure. And Fatso goes to find Amelia. And there's a knock at the door and this beautiful music starts playing and it's very Mm -hmm. somber. And oh my God, this is where Dr. Harvey is going to meet his wife again. And there's a white light shining behind the door with mist and this beautiful choral music. And then James Mm -hmm. opens the door to reveal Fatso in a red dress with a blonde wig. And he says, my man. (laughs) That's another extremely 90s. Yeah. Just like. (laughs) Kisses him. Reminds me of in Who Framed Roger Rabbit when when he opens the door in Toontown and that he thinks it's Jessica Rabbit. And then it's, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. Damn it. She has a really funny uh, hyena. It's um, Rita, Rina Hyena, I think is. Oh, yes. Yeah. The the character's name. Yeah. Uh, Man and runs after him to kiss him. Anyway. (laughs) Bill Pullman's performance, by the way, even in this rug pull of a moment. (laughs) Yeah. uh, He's great. So committed. He's so great in this. It really, like, especially later on in the movie when he does finally meet her, um, is so I think it's, it's just how he understates everything yeah. and he's like I've, I've heard from a lot of uh, people talking about acting that like it's it's a it's better than crying is trying not to cry in sure. a scene because if people relate to that more so it's like all you almost see that vulnerability on his face in a lot of these moments which again pushes this movie to a level that I don't think it was even really aware it was able to <laughs> I think he, I mean, he does such an incredible job of teetering back and forth between uh, outlandish uh, physical comedy yes, to these yeah. really intimate, like tender moments where exactly like you said, misty eyed and hopeful, Yeah, you know, it's also a really shitty thing that the ghost, <laughs> the is. ghostly trio do to him. Like, holy really cow, is. that's Monsters. heartless. <laughs> but yeah, this movie is, uh, it's really, really touching and um, it surprises you in a lot of ways. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that later that day, Vic, the boy from school, shows up at Kat's door and asks her to the dance. And Casper is watching this and he's kind of making fun of Vic behind his back. Mm-hmm. But she says she'd love to. After that, Vic meets up with Amber kind of around a around a tree or around a corner. And we find that there's alter- ulterior motives. Mm-hmm. So inside, Casper appears in Kat's music box and he's dancing with a little ballerina that's in kind of the jewelry box. And he says, see, I'm a good dancer. And then he's in a dresser drawer and he says, I don't even need a costume. And then in a closet, he's turned into a bunch of balloons. And he says, I'm always the life of the party. And he wants to go to the dance with Kat. He says, what's this guy got that I don't? And she says, a pulse. Oof, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he says, yeah, but can you do this? And Casper grabs her and pulls her and drags her. And she's screaming, no, 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 no. Off of a balcony where she falls. He flies down, grabs her, and by the ankle is carrying her away. 
Mm-hmm. As Superman, right? Like As Superman, yeah. He, yeah. Tur- he turns into like a Superman-esque figure, but he's got the voice of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, yeah. Come with me if you want to live or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's great. More 90s. More 90s. <laughs> he flies her to the top of this giant lighthouse that looks out over the ocean. Again, another really gorgeous shot. Yeah. And they have a really tender moment. And Casper... Yeah. You know, she asked him, what What were you like when you were alive? And he he realizes that he actually doesn't remember anything about being alive. He doesn't remember his mom or his dad. And he asks her, is that bad? And she says, no, it's just, it's kind of sad. Yeah. That night in bed, he tells her, you know, as a ghost, you tend to forget. And, you know, Kat's lie, lying down to go to sleep. And she's she mentions she's worrying about starting to forget her mother. Mm-hmm. You know, she can remember her laugh. I wrote these this line down specifically because I thought it was just really, really pretty. Her laugh and the sound of making breakfast and the way she put on her lipstick. I remember she used ivory soap. And when she'd hug me, I'd breathe her in really deep. And then every night when she put her to bed, she would say stardust in the eyes, rosy cheeks and a happy girl in the morning. And it just for me, I, I have memories like that of my mom. And there was yeah. a, little, a little thing that my mom would tell me and my brother every night before we went to sleep. And, it, you know, not to get you know, too personal, but at the loss of a parent, there is a point where you don't, um, it's not forgetting. It's just a bit of a move on or a bit of a, you carry it with you in a very different way. And um, for this character to be talking about these things in what is a children's movie Mm -hmm. is so bold, I think, and really wonderful. It really is. Yeah. This movie treats children with intelligence and I, I applaud it for that. Very mature subject matter. Mm -hmm. Um, but then in a way, it's like not mature. It's like everyone deals with this. It's inevitable. And yeah. the movie is inevitably because it's about a ghost, about death. And I love that they really didn't pull punches addressing that. Yeah. This is a ghost. Right. <laughs> like, this is a dead person. It's a child. Yeah. Nonetheless. And the the music specifically like really captures that sense of memory and mm. longing and regret almost in a weird way like, like a, i think james horner described it as like kind of a lost childhood in a way wow because um, he really responded to it um in a big way mm-hmm. um yeah like wow it, it really is moments like this like the lighthouse and in the bedroom where, she, where she's remembering her mom where you're like wow they really yeah, it really, yeah, it guts you a little bit. I don't think there's a dry eye in the house when, when you're watching these scenes. It really no, does. It's really tender. Yeah. She asks him, Casper, if my mom's a ghost, did she forget about me? Oof. He says, no, she'd never forget about you. Another moment where it's implied, um, she says, if my mom is a ghost, right, would she forget about me? Well, we'll find out later that she has not forgotten about her. Yeah. Oh. And Kat's, Kat's starting to fall asleep now and he says, Kat, if I were alive, would you go to the Halloween dance with me? And she, you know, sleeping. Mm-hmm. And then he uh, flies kind of close to her face and he says, Kat, can I keep you? And he kisses mm-hmm. her cheek. And her response to that as she's falling asleep is Casper closed the window. It's cold. Oh, again, another amazing button. Truly, genuinely, yeah. he goes to close the window. He looks sad, you know? Yeah. What you mentioned before, was this the screenwriter's first feature film? It was the director's first feature. Oh, was, okay, cool. I think it might have been the screenwriters as well. Because I think um, they had only been in TV animation. That is true. That is, yes, yeah, that is what I had read. crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is and a it was really kind of, well-written movie. It was uh, very opposite of the tone of this film, was the, yeah. the the things that they had written as well. Wow, bravo. They really did a beautiful job. <clears throat> it's really sweet. He he flies down to the foot of the bed and curls up at her feet, almost like a like a cat would, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and lays down next to her. Next morning, Kat <laughs> goes downstairs and she's excited and she sits down with her dad at breakfast and she asks if she can use his card to go to town to buy a Halloween costume. Oh, this is sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He you know, says, why don't you just wrap yourself in aluminum foil and go as a leftover? And you know, she, <laughs> she, she appeases his joke, but she wants to not she wants to not look funny. She wants to look nice, like mm-hmm. kind of date nice, you know? Yep. And he's like, oh, he has a reaction and he, it's a little bit of like a, oh, no, this is it moment. Mm-hmm. He's uneasy thinking about her growing up and he does admit that they're broke until Kerrigan pays them and she understands and she's really sweet about it. You know, practical. She says, I'm sure I'll find something that's perfect. Don't worry about it. The uncles are singing in the background. It's my party and I'll die if I want to. And she says, please, dad, don't let the ghostly trio crash this party. Cat finds the attic 
in the house mm -hmm. and opens this crate that is marked C. McFadden. And when she opens it, she smiles. And in therapy with the uncles, James is sad and he's unresponsive and not into it. You know, I think mm -hmm. between thinking he was going to meet Amelia the day before and then Kat growing up, he's just got the blues. So the uncles decide they're going to cheer him up at happy hour. And they yep. pick him up by the arms and they fly him away singing 99 bottles. At which point, Kerrigan and Dibs, who are looking in the window, realize now is the perfect time to go look for the treasure, right? Dibs says, you pay a guy to get ghosts out of the house and what happens? And Kerrigan says, yep. yeah, he gets the ghosts out of the house. Like, let's go look for this treasure. <laughs> Casper finds Kat in the attic and she has, in a very fast amount of time, cleaned up... <laughs> Oh, yes. This room that was full of crates and boxes. And it turns out it was Casper's playroom. And it's really magical and whimsical. Yeah. With, you know, these old toys, like wind up toys. And there's a yeah. train and 19th century. Mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. yeah. Tin kind of wind up tin toys. And I love it. On the wall, there is a clay kind of handprint of a, you know, a child's handprint with the name mm -hmm. Casper and he puts he puts his hand up to it and he's like I had five fingers and oh that's a great moment but it's yeah. kind of this is what's sparking him to remember what it was like like what he was like when he was yeah. alive <laughs> he he says I just remember you know I have remembered something else and he flies uh into the attic inside of a trunk and opens it up and he pulls out this old white dress wedding dress question mark yeah, maybe uh, yeah. some kind of gown. This was actually allegedly a really complicated shot for them because it flies into the air and Kat puts her arms up and then it drops on top of her. Yes. And working the strings for that specifically was really difficult to make it convincing. Wow. Yeah, I would have thought they shot it in reverse, but it doesn't make sense because all everything else would be wrong. <laughs> the fabric would be moving. Yeah, 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 yeah. The hair would be moving wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which I will say, she wears this dress for the rest of the movie. It's a cool costume piece. Her hair does not change, and she wears Doc Martens throughout the rest of the movie, too. <laughs> the Doc Martens I can get behind, I wouldn't have minded a hair change. <laughs> Yes, maybe something up or something like that. Yeah, yeah, or a, a curl, anything, something. Yeah, anything. Which, by the way, was this was this previous scene? Was that the musical number with so, the with the uncles? I there, I think it would have been then. There was okay. to be a musical number about you know what it's like to be dead. Yeah, they were like trying to cheer him up or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a bizarre. Yeah. It, yeah. it was cut for money. It was costing them way too much just to animate oh. what they already had, and so they never even animated it. Oh, wow. They yeah. may have filmed it, but they didn't add the animation. I think they have an, an animatic with just still keyframes on That's the DVD. Cool. Yeah. But I'm glad they cut that. That would feel bizarre. I don't think that fits the tone. Yeah, the I'm not really. anti-musical number. I just don't need yeah. it in this movie. Now, yeah. in the Adams Family, the Mamushka number, I wish to God they had kept that. Like, Adams yes. Family, it would have worked, but they yeah, cut it. Absolutely. <sighs> oh, well, the, that is available, the vocals. And obviously, Raul Julia is an incredible stage actor and singer. And yes. it's just, uh, man, I really wish they kept it. Anyway, <laughs> Casper tells her that this dress was his mom's. And she ties the sash around it. And she asks if she can wear it to the party tonight. And Casper says, mm-hmm. And then from across the room, he sees a sled. And he goes and sits down on the sled and tells a story that he begged. He doesn't even um, miss a beat before going into the story. It's very interesting, very um, almost a, like a theatrical, like it's just the transition from this cute, like happy moment to his delivery of this feels organic, but important. Yeah. He begged and begged to have this sled. His dad thought he couldn't handle it, but then one day he got it for no reason at all. And he took it out and he went sledding all day. His dad said that's enough, but he couldn't stop it. He was having so much fun. And then it got late and it got dark and it got cold and he got sick and his dad got sad. And that's how we learn how Casper died. It's clearly that he died of pneumonia, yeah. but like what a way to deliver that. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a hell of a soliloquy there. And, um, that's also, like, the word I couldn't think little... of. <laughs> Oh, no. Worries. I was like, is it an aside? Is it a monologue? No, it's a little bit. Yeah, it's technically a monologue, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the whole like the whole rosebud thing, too, like mm -hmm. the, the object of his childhood and ultimately the object of his death. Yeah. Um, yeah. What a great. Just, and back to back, just great little, very uh, impactful scenes that are mm -hmm. delivered so beautifully. Yeah. And Kat asks, what's it like to die? 
He says, it's like being born only backwards. Mm. I remember like I didn't go where I was supposed to go. I stayed behind so my dad wouldn't be lonely. And Kat notices these newspaper articles about McFadden's son dying and he's working on a machine to resurrect his dead son. It's called the Lazarus. Casper grabs Kat and flies her into a wall. And uh, he says, sorry, I guess we'll have to take the long way. So he takes Kat to something that her dad made. He hid it away so no one would find it. They go through a hidden passage and he puts Kat in this chair and it turns into basically a ride. The greatest ride Universal never made. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is all that my brother and I wanted when we were kids was this Absolutely. fucking thing to happen. Yeah. It uh, goes down a spiral staircase and then uh, through a trap door, which was so cool. Oh, yeah. And then the spooky corridor with flashing lights and it's in a cavern. Electrical, almost like Dr. Frankenstein equipment. Yeah. Is all around this old machinery. Bells and whistles going off. And then Cat is attacked by powder puffs on robotic arms. <laughs> and then a toothbrush brushes her teeth. Uh, shaving cream gets sprayed all over her. Uh, well, she misses the shaving cream, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think Ivan gets that later. <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, razors on robotic arms are <laughs> swooshing at her and she ducks down and then she just gets rinsed with water and blown dry yep. and combs like comb her hair and then a robotic arm puts a bow tie on her. Love it. And the chair rolls deeper and deeper down into this secret laboratory. And Casper calls that the up and atom machine. His dad had a trouble. He had trouble getting up in the morning. She says, <laughs> didn't you ever hear of caffeine? When I tell you, we, I, we had a, a office chair on wheels and I would push my brother around the house as though he were on the up and atom machine. Oh yeah. I yeah. guarantee we did that too. Like it was some rolling chair. Um that now that whole set, the the Lazarus set and of course Whipstaff Manor, that was at Universal Orlando for a long time. That's so cool. Did you get to see, I I grew up on the I don't West. I think Coast. I ever got to. Yeah, yeah I, I did Universal Hollywood. I didn't I don't I have never been to Universal Orlando and I used to work at oh, Disney. Wow. Yeah. Orlando is really cool, uh, and it's going to get cooler, I guess, with the the additional stuff that they're putting there. Yeah, um, but I, can't I don't wait. think I ever got to see Casper. Um, I don't think it was up for that long as an exhibit. They had the Casper, you know, promotional thing, and they had Whipstaff Manor, and they had, I think, the Lazarus, and they may have even had it. You can see it on YouTube. There's footage of it. They have like the chair. I think that moves and things. Um, but what a cool location what a cool set and yeah, yeah every kid just wanted to go on a ride yep it was like a haunted house it was so cool yes exactly so cat gets off of the machine and we see that kerrigan and dibs are now in a chair going through the up and out of machine <laughs> and they're yep. screaming and freaking out and dibs get sprayed in the face with shaving cream and then when the razors uh, start <laughs> swinging at him he starts doing like chopping arms yeah. to shield his face i think that moment is when they really became a, just a perfect duo yes just when they're both just panning it was just like uh what a better pairing for uh foils i guess you know but also partners in a movie yeah their their timing and their chemistry is Absolutely hysterical. It's just great. So Casper tells that uh, he used to play pirates down there with his dad. And we see that there's this giant piece of machinery under foggy water. And it is the Lazarus. But he can't remember how to rise it out of the water. Cat points at a, a metal door across the way. And she says, well, what about that? And Casper says, no, that's the vault. Now Kerrigan overhears yeah. him saying that. And her ears perk up. So Ka uh, Casper's tinkering around with buttons and stuff. And Kat looks at the desk and finds a, a Frankenstein, a copy of the book Frankenstein and opens it up and there are buttons hidden inside. And she pushes the red button and the room begins to rumble and the Lazarus, ma Lazarus machine rises from the foggy water. It's huge. It has seaweed on it. It is a really cool set piece. Oh yeah. In the background, Kerrigan and Dibs are trying to open the vault and they can't. And Kat finds this really cool vial of red liquid, almost shaped like an upside down light bulb. Yeah. And Casper informs her that that is what makes the machine work. It's sort of an instant primordial soup mix. It's what brings go. It's what brings ghosts back to life. And there's room, and there's enough for just one. So Casper loads it up into the machine, and Kat pulls a lever. The door opens, Gasper goes in, and he says, I'm going to be alive. And the door <laughs> closes. Cat is looking at levers and stuff, and she flips, she kicks it, actually, with her boot, and the machine oh, yeah. starts up. But 
without them seeing it, Dibs takes the red liquid, that elixir, from the machine, and the machine powers down. So when Cat opens the door where Casper went and the fog lifts, he has been turned into a sunny up egg. I love that. It's so adorable. funny. Yeah. He says, Am I alive? And one of his eyes just droops down. <laughs> I remember like distinctly getting a laugh in the theater. I remember that moment in the theater. For sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't doubt it. We cut to Kerrigan and Dibs walking through the halls of the house. She's got the liquid in her hand and she says, do you know what this means? The barriers are broken. People are free to come and go as they please. You can fly through walls as, stick, as thick as steel. Dead one mm -hmm. minute and alive in the Riviera. Mm -hmm. and Dibs tells her, if you were a ghost. And she looks at him and she says, if you were. And then she grabs a battle axe and starts chasing him with it. <laughs> uh, he, it's, this is so such a Scooby Doo moment, right? Because oh, they're yeah. running down the halls. He is suddenly in a suit of armor and he's putting <laughs> brown goop on the floor, like an oil slick. And she slides and screams in her Kathy Moriarty like scratchy, smoky oh, voice, and love it. she crashes out of a window. He runs outside. She tries to run him over with a car. He throws the head of a statue at the windshield and. Dibs, you're taking this way too personally. She crashes into a tree. Yep. And when she steps out of the car, the tree is leaning over a massive seaside cliff and she falls to her death. Yep. Dibs is doesn't skip a beat before he is moving on. You know, she had my favorite sunglasses. <laughs> I think he says, what a tragic waste. And as he turns away, this massive shadow arises behind him. And we hear Kerrigan's voice, not so fast, little man. The bitch is back. And that's the first of two bitches that we'll hear in this movie. Yeah. This she was a scary movie. ghost. Too. Honestly? Yeah, yeah. For real. Very intimidating. We cut to a dive bar and James is singing Jailhouse Rock drunkenly <laughs> at happy hour karaoke. I love there's one like hammered bar fly in the background. Of oh, this. yeah. The rest of the it's clear everyone else in the bar has run off terrified the places in shambles yeah he's probably not even sure what he's seeing <laughs> he, he absolutely has no idea what he's looking at the ghosts commiserate about his heartache and they decide it's time to turn the ghostly trio into a quartet and you know let's just put james out of his misery so they grab a harpoon and a shotgun and i think it's stinky <laughs> shatters a beer bottle yep and yep. they start to try to sneak up on him but james turn around and they hide their weapons, which it's funny because they're hiding their weapons behind their translucent body. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> man. That's a good gag. He just tells them how much he appreciates them. He admires their companionship. And he is hammered and jabbering on and on about nothing, but that they don't have to cross over. It's their house and he loves them and they start <laughs> to cry. Possessions die <laughs> tense of the law. Exactly. <laughs> it's your house. You're haunting it. They cry and decide they can't kill him. But... He decides to rally and they're going to go hit every bar in town. And as he backs his way out of this bar, he falls down a construction ditch and perishes. Yeah. Back in the laboratory, Kerrigan's ghost flies into the vault and opens it from the inside. And she flies out with a treasure chest. Now Dibs enters in a rolling in the rolling chair or in the sorry, <laughs> yeah. Dibs enters in the chair from the up and out of machine and he's covered in shaving cream and he's got a bow tie on his <laughs> neck and but he has the elixir of life right yep so casper frightens him and he falls into the water and casper grabs that elixir and hands it to cat she sits down in the chair and uh casper pushes it back up the stairs back in reverse and we see the whole up and out in reverse and then we hear the doorbell ring so Kat goes to answer it, and it is all of her classmates, and they're here for the Halloween dance, and they're all in costumes, and the teacher is maybe dressed as a lobster. He's got, like, red I feel, oven yeah, mitts. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a lobster, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We see Amber, the mean girl, and Vic, her tag-along, climbing in through a window. Amber has ghost makeup on and, like, blood around her neck, and, you know, Amber, do we really have to do this? And, you know, the 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 plan is to fright, to scare Cat, I guess, in front of everybody. yeah. We get this great shot of the kids entering the house all in this huddled group and they get to the middle of the ballroom floor and they hear Kerrigan laugh and they all shriek. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's the best. Now Kat and Casper go back to the Lazarus in the laboratory and they put the elixir in the machine to put Casper in it. But then Kerrigan takes over. She tells Dibs to turn on the machine. She calls him a flaccid little worm. <laughs> Yes. Which is so good. Pretty harsh. <laughs> <laughs> 
and he decides to stand up to her, right? Like she's a ghost. What's she going to do? He yeah. is still alive. And now that he has the treasure, he doesn't need her. Uh, and he says, I'm going to go to the Riviera. I'm going to get a dog named Kerrigan, a bitch just like you. Oh, man. Oh, his involved. delivery is, I, it's, he's just so good in this movie. Oh, it's great. Yeah. But Kerrigan uppercuts him and he flies into the air out of a window, assumingly to die. I think he may have died. Yeah. And how he didn't come back. Maybe he's happily crossed over. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We never see him again. That's the end of him. Which, by the way, does that break the rule of the ghosts being unable to harm? Maybe she's just that evil. So I had it. I had that in mind when uh, when we were talking about that earlier. That you know, ghosts can't harm you. But I'm not going to ask too many questions. <laughs> yeah, I assume she's just so powerful. It, yeah. Casper tells her, you know, aren't you forgetting something? Your unfinished business. And and Kerrigan, she's got the treasure chest under her arm, and she's a ghost. And you know, she says, I have no unfinished business. I have my mansion. I have my money. I'm just perfect. And light starts to emit from her ghostly body yeah. and she starts to realize no 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 wait no i'm not perfect i have lots of unfinished business yeah. i'm not ready to cross over yet but she does and she explodes and it's great they they do away with the villain when the movie still has over 20 minutes which i think is really interesting because yeah. we get all this um it's not even i don't that's not even the climax really no right? yeah i no, think the definitely. climax is probably james talking to amelia which we're about to get to yeah so Kerrigan has crossed over. Cat catches the vial out of her hand in a very dramatic slow-mo. And the chest falls to the ground and opens up. And it turns out that inside of it was a baseball and a baseball glove. Mm -hmm. And this was the treasure. And it was autographed by Duke Snyder of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Casper's favorite player. Oh. Kind of reminiscent of, did you ever see the Richie Rich movie with? Of course. Yeah. How their yeah. vault was not money at all. It was all of their family treasures, all of yeah. their keepsakes and pictures. And yeah, the personal stuff. Yeah. yeah. I love that. It's, it's sweet. Cat says, Casper, it's time. And he gets into the machine. But then James flies in and he's a ghost and he's a drunk ghost. He's still drunk. Yep. And he doesn't remember Kat. And it's really upsetting. Kat, it is really Christina sad. does a really great job with this scene. I mean, they both do. Um, and, you know, she she tells him, don't you remember? And she holds out her pinky to pinky promise. Oof. Because that was what they did before in the car. And he says, oh, I remember. And he grabs her pinky and pulls it like a fart. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she blows that off and grabs his pinky and they pinky promise and now yeah. he remembers and yeah. he feels really really bad and you know he's holy shit what have i done yeah so casper sacrifices his own ability to become alive again mm -hmm. he says come on dr harvey you need this more than i do and he puts james into the lazarus and he pulls the lever and the lights flash all over the house the kids start screaming you know the kids that are there for the dance mm -hmm. and when the door opens again james is alive again <sighs> and hugs cat he tells her to go have fun at her uh sorry that's the end of that sequence so mm -hmm. we cut to the party and kids are dancing they're having fun they're a little spooked some of them have like kind of an yeah. eye over their shoulder <laughs> that one the moment where the two kids back into each other that's great james and cat are standing at the top of the staircase and james tells her to go have fun at her party he's starting to let go yeah amber has climbed onto Vic's shoulders. She's dressed as a tall, scary ghost with like a sheet over, you know, draping. She's looking in the mirror at how cool she looks. And then the ghostly trio appear out of the mirror and scare them. And they run through the party screaming like idiots. She falls off of his shoulders and he runs away, dragging her behind. So yeah. everyone laughs and applauds. And they think that it's a stunt that Kat has pulled off at her own party. So yeah. cool. Now Kat's going to be popular and Amber looks like an idiot. Yeah. Casper is sitting alone in his old playroom and he's sad and he's lonely and he's tossing his baseball up and down in the air. When from the rafters, this beautiful light starts to shine and Amelia appears. And I really like that this movie never specifically admits that she's an angel. Yes. But it, it they say the word angel. It implies when she appears, it's almost wing-like the animation. And then yeah. she's in this gorgeous red dress that has fabric falling from the sleeves. I think it's a really bold choice to use a red dress. Definitely. She definitely pops from the rest of the uh, art direction and stuff, which is probably why they chose it. Mostly we're, we're kind of in pale blues and stuff. Yes. So to have her really, and I don't think we've seen much red in this movie up till no. that point, except for the elixir mm -hmm. and her. 
Um, yeah, so it's a beautiful decision, definitely. Yeah, Casper asks her, are you an angel? And we don't get a full nod from her. We get an acknowledgement that's almost a nod. I don't know yeah. why I'm so, I, I just really, I think it's cool that it's it's implied but not spoken. Definitely. And I think that's the strongest choice. Because sure. it keeps us away from religious uh, impositions in this. That's really important, actually. I never considered that. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. we're talking about the afterlife. Obviously, that exists in every belief system and mm -hmm. stuff. And they really did. They didn't specify one or the other. That's really smart. Yeah. So she rewards him for his noble act by telling him you're going to be a boy for, for one night. She. Yeah. It's interesting, right? If she isn't in this, quote, angel realm, she mentions that she is proud of him. And she knows that his father is proud of him as well, which is implying that her father is probably in the same place that she is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're going to get your wish, but only for a night, sort of a Cinderella deal. And he says, so I get until midnight. She says 10. Cinderella wasn't 12 years old. <laughs> she blows some glittery dust at him. <laughs> yeah. And the, the gl glittery dust fades into the mirror ball in the oh, bar. I love it. And we get the piano chords for, I really genuinely love this song. It's, I was listening I to it earlier too. today. It's just yeah. nice. And it's... A silly pop song, but yeah, '90s power ballad. Yeah, like, yeah, for sure, for sure. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I, it I've is. been considering the Mariah Carey thing right now ever since you brought that up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what? You're you're absolutely right. I'd love to hear her sing it. So, Cat's sitting alone at, in the ballroom. It's a slow, you know, slow dance. Like I remember, mm -hmm. we didn't slow dance much when I was that age, but we would go roller skating, and I remember couple skates, and it would always sure. be. The mirror ball and couple skate only like you had to have someone you had to be holding hands with someone to be on the floor mm -hmm. and it was always rushing around to try to find a girl <laughs> a girl to ask to escape with. <laughs> anyway cat has no one but at the top of the stairs this boy in like an old timey kind of poet's yep. blousey shirt with like boots you know he just looks like he's out of another time Yep. appears at the top of the stairs party in the crowd yeah walks down the stairs and we don't see his face it's all from behind his head. Mm -hmm. He offers her his hand and she accepts and she looks into his, you know, looks into his face. We can't see it until he turns her around. And it's Devin Sawa when he was like 12 years old. Yep. Super young. Yeah. Super young. And it's funny because he kind of looks like Casper, which is bizarre. Like, I wonder if they tried to either interject that into the character or vice versa or yeah. It's there. It's the head shape. There's something about the head shape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it it's might have to do with round. that, you know, that 90s haircut that's just parted down the middle. Oh, like, yeah. That was my haircut for my entire childhood. Oh, yeah. That yeah. or, oh my God, we used to get flat tops also. <laughs> oh, my dad was in the army before I was born. So I think the flat top haircut. Oh, thing sure. Was, sure. Was part of that. But so the all it's so funny. All of the girls around have noticed who she's dancing with and kind of have like a, a longing look on their faces. He got this gig. So they had been in now and then together. So they'd already made one oh, movie okay. together. And the director was pulling all these boys in for the audition. And he specifically wanted one because the, the characters, he's only in it for a total of maybe 90 seconds. Yeah, very short. He was watching Christina Ricci and how she reacted when someone walked into the room. Mm. And when he walked into the room, she reacted. And that's when the director knew, okay, we're casting Devin Sawa. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah, they dance and as they're dancing, they start to float up into the air. When I tell you that I was a little, how old was I? I think I was nine. Oh my God. It was a little nine-year-old budding gay boy having the biggest crush on Devin Sawa when oh, I was a I've kid. I've heard that story. Yes, everybody says this was a awakening for them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> he, I mean, he was all over like the the Teen Beat and the, the Teeny yeah. Popper magazines. And uh, he's going to, I'm going to Connecticut Horror Fest in a couple of weeks. He's going to be there. Oh, cool. And I will absolutely be asking him to sign a Casper poster. Can I keep you? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I'm sure he'll be so flattered. He has said that he gets asked if um, he gets asked that specific line on Twitter at least once a day. That's incredible. And yeah, I don't know. Um, That's so cool. Yeah, oh, man. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if he cringes or not, but I'm excited. No, are you kidding? I'm sure he's so flattered to be remembered in any way like that. Uh, yeah, I hope so. He is, you know, they're dancing and he um, pulls her close and whispers in her ear. I told you I was a good dancer. Can <laughs> I keep you? Which is, you know, what Casper said to her comes before. Back in. Yep. 
and she realizes it's Casper. Now, from above on the balcony, James is watching this happen, and Amelia appears before him. And she's in that red dress. Have you noticed the window behind her where she appears? Yes. So it's that... shaped like angel wings. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. So we get this cool moment where she doesn't have wings, but the window that she's in front of does. So That's again, so smart. the implication of being an angel without having to commit to being an angel. Beautiful art direction in this movie. Oh yeah, gorgeous throughout. There should be a book, a coffee table book of like the making of Casper, just all the set design and stuff. I would love something like that. I wonder if something like that was released when the movie was. There must it's be possible. Of, I mean, there were yeah. definitely press packets. and Yeah, it was a big enough movie. Yeah, for sure. Bill, as we already talked about, his performance is incredible. Yeah. And he is so good in this scene. And he just tells her, I thought it, he... He, um, there's no, oh my God, it's you or anything. Yeah. It's just instantly, I thought I'd have a million things to say to you. Yeah. How? She says, let's just say, you know, three crazy ghosts who kept their word. So the ghostly trio did actually keep their word about getting Amelia to him. And yeah. um, she tells him that you and Kat loved me so much when I was alive. I had no unfinished business. Don't let me be yours. Oof. What? What a oh, incredible man. It's line. A kids movie. Yes. <laughs> It's and, not a know, cartoon. Yeah, it's like unbelievable. She comforts him and tells him he's doing a good job raising Cat, but he needs to let her go. Yeah. And, you know, he agrees. She gives him some advice. Don't listen on the phone. French fries are not a breakfast food. And don't ask <laughs> her to wear a T-shirt underneath her bathing suit. <laughs> our daughter, all she is. Our oh, daughter a is a teenager. Yeah. yeah. That's so great. It's, it's so good. It really, and the music on this, obviously, we have the theme is mm -hmm. back, the, the whole longing theme. Just, just like... You cannot help but get choked up watching and, this you know, whole scene. Cat is discovering kind of love or romance or those yeah. feelings downstairs, whereas he's kind of letting go. And it's this yeah. really remarkable moment. She touches his face. It's really tender. And he kisses her hand. And then the clock starts striking 10 p.m. Yep. And he asks, wait, where are you going? And she says, where well, I can watch over both of you until we're together again. And she flies away. Oof. back into that window that's shaped like angel wings. Downstairs, Kat and Casper kiss, and we get this shot of the back of Devon Sawa's head, and as they're kissing, his head turns back into Casper's ghost mm -hmm. head, and he's translucent, and we see through Casper's head, Christina Ricci's reaction to him disappearing. It's so great. Kids see him disappear and turn into a ghost, and then he just turns around and says, boo, and all the kids start screaming and it's like cartoonish where yeah. like their hair starts sticking up and it's all high speed and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I run, love it. Run out of the house. The noise is like sound effects of a stampede. <laughs> and uh, as as the mirror ball crashes to the to the ground, Kat looks at Casper and says, not bad for my first party. And the ghostly trio appears dressed as little Richie singing the Casper theme song in his Little Richie's voice. He did a cover, a pop cover of the cartoon yeah, theme song. I love Little Richard. He's the best. Oh my God. So good. Cat and James are, uh, are dancing in the ballroom together and Casper flies into the air and he writes the end in the sky in ghostly ectoplasm. Something. Mark, smoke. Yeah. smoke. <laughs> and then he flies into the camera and that's the end. Or so we think because <laughs> about 30 seconds later, Stretch dresses Little Richard, pops his way through the credits and sings oh, yeah. a high note and then disappears. And now oh. the movie's over. And that's 1995's Casper. Dance party ending. It is the best. Yeah, for real. <laughs> that's a great Halloween party song, too. That Little Richard cover. It is. Honestly, I'm going to add that to my Halloween playlist. Yeah, I got the I got a, a, a record uh, company released Casper on vinyl and it's actually nice. a translucent vinyl. It's like a like a ghost. That's cool. And uh, that's on there. And more that thing spins a bunch. This, I this bet. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, that would be lovely on vinyl for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's just go right into the rating. On Rick or Treat Horrorcast, there's a rating system. A movie's either a trick, which means it's okay, or it's a treat, which means you love it, or it is a smell my feet, which means it sucks. George. I mean, it's a treat for me. Yeah. I love, I love Casper. Yeah. 100%. It sounds like you do. <laughs> I'm in the yeah. same boat. Oh, yeah. Treat, it's treat, so treat. funny. 
because I like I, I sort of recently rediscovered it because it was just one of those movies that it came out. It was a it was a big deal that sort of went away, but it was so buried deep in the 90s, which was really taken over by like Jurassic Park and all mm-hmm. these other huge franchises. But I rewatched it and, and it the emotional impact of a impact of it really did hit me, uh, which was the first thing I was like, this is the music, obviously, and, and just the the content uh, was a lot stronger than I would ever remembered. And yeah. it was just delightfully fun. It's so fun and it's so tight and it's it's well written and uh, it's just a good time. It's a perfect Halloween movie. It really is. I agree. I absolutely agree. All of that. And, you know, just to touch again on gateway horror, I have said in the past and I, I stand by it. A lot of my taste in horror movies has it stemmed from Disney movies. If you think yeah. of like you mentioned before, Night on Bald Mountain with Chernabog on top of the mountain at the yeah. end of Fantasia the headless horseman in the animated sleepy hollow, you know, legend of uh, adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Yeah. Such an incredible sequence, you know, Uh, poor unfortunate souls. Like that is a horror movie in a two and a half minute song. And so, you know, I think that's why I love Gothic style horror so much. And so movies like this only fed into me becoming a horror obsessed child. And uh, maybe it's a morbid curiosity or something, but I would hope that this movie's more mature themes also help shape me into the person that I am, whether I knew it or not when I was a kid. And I probably didn't. Yeah, I definitely think it, it went over my head when I was younger. But as as an adult watching it, um, I'm, I'm really impressed and, and touched by it. And it's, it's touching how seriously they took it, mm-hmm. um, which I think is sort of missing from some more modern films. I feel like there's an air of cynicism Mm -hmm. uh, going into making these things where people either really don't care. They're kind of, this is, this isn't the movie they want to be making. So they're just kind of making it, whatever. But this really felt like people poured their hearts into it. And I think a lot of that is attributed to Spielberg being involved and how, how much he really puts everything into stuff that he makes. Um, And obviously credit to the director and the writers and the cast and everything and uh, the composer. But um yeah, it uh, it's a shame that I assume it did well financially when it came out, uh, maybe not as well as it wanted to, but it's a shame that it was kind of panned back then. Um, but it's certainly made a resurgence and uh, hopefully it will stay right up there with Hocus Pocus and all those other classics of the 90s Halloween movies. It I've noticed around Halloween time, it starts popping up on streaming services. Yeah. More and more. I think I yeah. rediscovered it in maybe five, six years ago, it was on HBO. It was before the pandemic. It was on HBO. Yeah. And I was like, man, I haven't seen this in years. And I fell in love all over again. And now yeah. I, I have since bought it. So I always have access to it on Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I bought the uh, the Blu-ray. I don't think we have a 4K of it yet, but I will certainly be buying a 4K I, of, yeah. of the movie. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's such a treat. It's such a treat. I love Casper. And it really does, for us, it really does transport us to a different time which i almost can't believe i was ever part of yeah <laughs> it's kind of like what a different era how much things have changed yeah but uh, it's delightful uh, as a nostalgic piece but also just it's just a fun movie and it immediately sets the mood for october and spooky season yeah for sure you know what other movie did a really great job of explain or dealing with death and grief was the new haunted mansion did you see it i haven't seen it yet please do i really i mean it it was competing with barbenheimer i don't know why the hell they yeah. decided to do that but like I'm sure it'll be on Disney Plus in time for October. Watch it. It really impressed me. Really, really liked it. And uh, Keith Stanfield is the lead, and he does a, an incredible job of working through his grief through the course of this movie. Wow. Yeah, it's just yeah. really good. He's tremendous in, in everything he does. So I'll definitely, uh, definitely be checking that out then, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, an example of like a movie doesn't have to be bloody, gory, you know, slasher in order to be considered or to fall under the umbrella of horror. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I wish we had more just, I guess you could almost just call them Halloween movies. Yeah, but, for sure. Yeah. For sure. All right, George, uh, will you please tell my listeners where they can stalk you and where they can stalk <laughs> and listen to Music of the Macabre? Absolutely. Feel free to stalk me on Instagram at George Stryker and at Music of the Macabre, uh, which is where I do a lot of posts, fun Halloween posts for the album as well. And the album is available at musicmacabre.com and on Spotify. Terrific. And you've already heard snippets of it. The whole album is just as gorgeous. And I genuinely can't recommend it enough. Actually, I recommended it, George, to a friend today who then listened to it and texted me later and said, please tell George how much I enjoyed this. So that's from my friend, Matt. Shout out to Matt. 
Oh, thank you, Matt. That's really sweet. Yeah, for sure. And I can't wait for more from you, George. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And listeners, you can find the podcast on Instagram at Rick Retreat Pod, TikTok at Rick Retreat Pod. My YouTube is Rick Retreat and my website is rickretreat.com. Thank you all so much. And we'll see y'all later, spookies. Thanks for coming Rick Retreating. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre with orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. My website, rickertreat.com, is designed and maintained by Evelyn DeVere. The show's social media content is created by my evil minion and social media manager, Stanley Martin. The Rick Retreat logo was designed by Philip Romano. Contact information and links to these artists can be found in the episode description. Check them out, they're frighteningly talented. Rick Retreat Horrorcast is independently produced by me, Ricky J. Duarte, of Rick Retreat Productions. If you like what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well, they're coming to get you, listener. <laughs>